taken up by Kajal type of people in Delhi, and uh, later uh, people like uh, Shubhajit, and made some very successful uh, scientific, uh, can I say product or process, yeah. okay, which we wanted to continue further, and which will be an example for others to emulate on various other uh, model systems. And so we start with uh, Kajal and her exploits, which I'm sure that she was standing on the shoulders of several people earlier. So that story, so it's called the Moina story, right? So Moina story one, Kajal will be talking about, and Moina story two, Shubhajit will be talking about, and then we will move on. So good morning, everyone. I'm Kajal. I joined Cube in 2014 when I enrolled for my bachelor's degree in Acharya Narendev College, Delhi University. So today I'm here to talk about the moral system that I bonded with, bonded with so strongly that I'm here talking about it again. So the moral system that I will be talking about is called Daphnia or Moina. But what's in the name, whether it's Daphnia or Moina? So, uh, uh, Juliet said to Romeo, what's in, a, what's in a name? So whether science is a kind of poetry or not, we will have a discussion about it. But there is a, a distinction between science and poetry. In science, names matter a lot. Uh, probably not only in science, if we go a little out of line, considering the number of stations and uh, uh, places that have been renamed recently, there indeed a lot is name, in name. So. Uh, before going to how Daphnia, convert, uh, Daphnia has been renamed to Moina, I will talk about how I got introduced to Daphnia in the first place. So when I started working on Daphnia, it was called TCDS. So in 2015, uh, in December only, I came here to uh, came here in a workshop, and my mentor was Priyanka Parihar. She introduced me. Uh, introduced me to a model system that was then called TCDS, the chosen Daphnia species. We had many objectives that uh, is the prime uh, goal of you when you start working with the model system, that you want to answer some questions. So uh, at that time, we had a long-term question that is still continued to identify uh, and to know more about the molecular mechanism that is there in the hemoglobin gene expression under hypoxia in uh, Moina. So many of you who are in queue for quite some time now would be knowing about this hypothesis that has been carried out for like four or five years at least. So, the, uh, so uh, when we started working upon it, uh, it has been uh, about three years that TCDS was in uh, Cube already. So uh, we were given the name, uh, we had already been given the, uh, the, the identity of uh, TCDS as Daphnia, but uh, thanks to the words of Priyanka as well as Arnan sir, we should always uh, start from the starting. Probably that's why we have uh, we can verify the things that we have been told about. So we defined our short-term objective with the first one as identify the species of uh, Daphnia we had. So uh, in the uh, objective that we had already, we still had some biases that we already were trying to find out the species that we have about the model system that we call Daphnia at that time. And other short-term objective uh, that uh, is related to the long-term objective that I already mentioned. So uh, I had to start with my first short-term objective, that was to identify the species of Daphnia that I had. So I started from the starting, as they say. So I came to know that uh, it was isolated in 2020, uh, 2012 when people from uh, uh, Cube Mumbai collected it from a pond and then uh, made a single aisle culture and named it as TCDS. So I found this. Uh, uh, this mail of 2014 when I joined, because before that I cannot have the mail access to the forum that I'm a part of. So uh, e even in this mail, uh, you can read that uh, uh, Jay Kishan has mentioned that uh, we have three species of Daphnia, and we have to identify which one of ours is. So we already have Daphnia, but we have to identify the species that we have. So uh, there is a saying in, uh, uh, in science that is called nullius in verba, it's a Latin term, that means take nobody's word for it. So did I, 
I did not uh, uh, believe it to be, I mean, I wanted it to start from the starting, so I thought that I will probably start from the higher classification because when we do taxonomy, we start from the kingdom and not from the species. I mean, that's quite opposite, right? So uh, science is a culture of doubt, and uh, doubt is not disrespect. Doubt arises because you have questions, and doubt leads to questions. So I had a doubt whether it's really Daphne or not, so I continued. So uh, this is the link of the website that I keep sharing on in the groups. If you have ever asked which species of uh, uh, branchiopod you are uh, uh, isolating, so uh, they came up. So in this website, what happens is uh, you start. You have a, a picture of your organism, and you start from the kingdom level. So you will have animal, and then arthropoda, and then uh, crustaceans, then branchiopods, and that's how you go to a level where you will see this image, where it will add, it will divide into families. So the first is Moinidae family, and the second one is Daphnidae. So the picture that I had was more similar to the uh, to the first section of the the left hand side picture. So uh, now it, it's very easy to click on the left-hand side, but at that point, I remember, I clicked so many times to prove that probably my animals belong to the right-hand side picture because this is where Daphnia was. Moina was on the left-hand side picture. And honestly, uh, the next day, we, so we had uh, discussions every Saturday in Think Lab, the Cube uh, in ANDC, Cube Center in ANDC. So uh, we always had to uh, tell the things that we th uh, did that week. So uh, I, would, I was asked, what did I do? I didn't tell that I actually find out this because I didn't have the courage or uh, didn't have the confidence to tell the people that probably uh, the organism that I'm working with is not the organism I thought I'm working with, okay? So uh, about a week later when people said that, okay, post it on the forum itself at least for, uh, for for your organism's sake. So I uh, posted it on the mail, and honestly speaking, no one responded except Rundan sir for about uh, at least three months. So uh, about three months later, I again came back with some, uh, some confidence because uh, there was this guy, Imtiaz Gulami. Uh, he was a cubist, and uh, he told that he, ca he has worked on Daphne uh, Moina for about two years. And then once I asked that, see, I think it's Moina, you know, I don't think so, it's Daphne. He's like, oh, probably, because, you know, Daphne are bigger in size and this is very small. So I'm like, you have been working on it for two years. Could you not tell that to people that Daphne are bigger in size? Moina are very small. Like, Daphne is about uh, at least uh, 0.5 mm to 1 mm, and uh, Moina are maximum 0.5 mm, okay? So I posted on the mail forum, and then, uh, and then uh, I had to tell them what the differences were. So uh, I don't have a picture of Daphnia here for comparison. I just want you to know that there were not only one difference that I came upon with. I had four point, uh, at least four points that I could see in the microscope itself. We didn't have to go for other second, uh, other things to. Uh, say that it's actually Moina. We can see it uh, if we see closely. So I had a claim that people did not believe and continue to not believe for two and a half years because, uh, because we have a belief here. We believe that whatever have been told to us must be right. So uh, I decided to gain confidence from the people who are more experienced than me and people uh, whose voices will uh, back up my statement. So I tried that if they don't believe me because I'm just a second year student in bachelor's degree, probably they will listen to people who are already scientists in their field. So I first contacted a PhD student uh, in uh, from Pune, uh, I think from Pune University. His name is Samir Padhyay. He is now uh, doing postdoc from outside. But at that time, he was the first person who replied uh, to a mail thread that I sent to him asking whether what is the species you think it belongs to, uh, Moina or Daphnia. So he was quite confident that it's Moina only. But uh, only one person is not uh, enough for people to believe to. So I, I went abroad. I mean, not literally, but I mailed a person from uh, a from different country, uh, Austria. So uh, there is a lady called Loris Moir. So I wrote to her after reading a research paper that she had uh, uh, that she had uh, published that year, probably uh, saying that she had rediscovered Moina macrocopa from uh, 
from a species, something like that. So I just wrote to her, and she's like, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely moinidae, but we cannot directly go to, uh, but we cannot identify it until we have more uh, uh, clear pictures or the specimen sample. So, uh, so the lack of pictures and continuity to take it to the samples, uh, uh, take it to lab where they can identify it, uh, 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 what you call, like stop the process of further identification. So, but still, uh, based upon preliminary pictures that we had and the help that I got from other people, uh, 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 this is a slide that uh, I, uh, I made about two and a half years ago. Uh, the, in that also, uh, we mentioned that probably the TCC, TCCS, because the chosen crustacean species, now at least we know that it's not Daphne, if not Moena. So the cho uh, chosen crustacean species uh, probably belongs to Moena macrocopa because uh, it has the antenue segmentation is different. Distal fork tooth, uh, if you just uh, look at the pictures, that will be clear, but they should be comparative, uh, comparative Daphne pictures. So leave that. So uh, coming back to nomenclature, uh, what's in the name? Probably there's nothing in name when we talk about uh, casually, but in science, names matter a lot. Because in science, na uh, nomenclature is a system of naming things, uh, depending upon uh, giving it a unique identity. So uh, sophistication that we create by giving different scientific names that we have is not just to uh, rule out all the local or vernacular names that are different from different places. It, uh, nomenclature also uh, gives uh, emphasis that the two individuals are different. They have similarities, but they, are dif they have different name because they have different characteristic that make them different and give them their individuality. So, taxon so this leads to a more uh, broader field of science that is called taxonomy that involves naming of organism, the identification and classification because uh, when we identify the differences between individuals, we, we classify them according to the characteristic that they have. And uh, the taxonomic nomenclature system is very important because it also communicates the complexity that have arisen due to the processes of evolution and adaptations. So uh, the claim that I made was not uh, formally accepted uh, uh, until Dr. Subhajit Sain did some uh, used tools and techniques to give it a more uh, characterize and uh, define identity that is now Moina macrocopa. So the thing that I want to end up uh, with is that uh, when we are young, we think that we are scientists, uh, when we discover new things, new things that never existed. But uh, uh, during the, my journey with uh, Moina, uh, I came to know that Moina was always Moina. Daphne did not become Moina. Moina was also always Moina. So uh, the thing that I learned is to do science, you need not find new things. You just have to falsify the things that, all, uh, the, that exist already. So, uh, so this is how it will ever be for whatever model organism you work with, whatever question you work with, you will always be doing science by falsifying whatever claims had been made earlier. So uh, thanks to Subhajit Sain, Dr. Subhajit Sain, sorry, and, and his uh, student who, used, uh, who actually gave the identity that uh, I started with. Um, so TCDS, the chosen Daphnia species, will never be called Daphnia now and will always be known as Moina macrocopa until some of you make a claim that it's not because there's always scope for doing science. Thank you. So uh, I would like to end with a video that, uh, that summarizes the story that I have. If you have any question, you can ask later. Probably most of you have seen it already, but for those of you who have not. Uh, there's no sound or what?
Tchau. She's amazing, isn't she? But honestly, it was not love at first sight. I haven't heard about Daphnia already a lot of times of my being in Cube for almost an year now. But it was only in that winter workshop at the end of 2015 in Mumbai that I actually met TCDS in person. She was beautiful, just like this. And a scholar as well with her epigenetic studies. So at first, I thought she was way out of my league. But her simplicity made it all easier. She could mingle with anyone. I mean, unlike other model systems, she could take care of herself very easily if given attention only once a day with a drop of milk. It was the beginning though. As the days passed, I got to see her different colors from transparent to pale to red and I started to get along with her more. We brought her together at Delhi to get to know more about her. But as they say, and I experienced, things don't always turn out the way we imagine it to be. Within a month, I was struggling to keep things as planned. Our cultures were not working. We were not able to figure out what was wrong. She used to be such a lively creature, and now she was like all tantrums and stuff. We started to try finding answers and made our hypothesis. And we came up with temperature. Made sense back then, not now though. Projected. Next, the water. To be honest, it's embarrassing to even mention it now. Well, whatever the reason was, it definitely was not me, right? Um, wrong. As I came to realize eventually. She did not only teach me the scientific method, but also the perks of working in a group where there is mutual benefit to everyone. Yeah, collaboration. So I decided it was my time to pay her back. And by chance, I got the chance. However, I had not expected that it will be this difficult to convince others. Evidences they need. So I guess it was time to learn more things. And as always, collaborators came to the rescue. Because evidences were important, so was the approval. After all, she deserved to be known for what she was. Soon enough, she got to be known as Moina now. But I still had to know few more things. Like, labs are not defined by instruments and devices, but model systems. That inspiration does not always look like him or her or him, sometimes them. And the same goes for collaboration. It looked like this once. But the most important thing that I had to learn still awaited. Apparently, the Moina claim needed more attention. So I continued. The labs changed. She stayed. The faces changed, but she was there. The question changed, and she was still there. However, apparently, these questions escalated quite quickly. Huh? She indeed is interesting. Now, whenever I look back, I end up recalling the first lesson I ever learned in Cube. That the most important thing is the culture. And evidently, it is. Be it the culture of your model system or the culture of the Cube itself, the three Cs. Communication, collaboration, and continuity. So, stay curious and keep questioning. Because as they say, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing.
so, so we'll take some question for some uh, some time. By the way, uh, Kajal has an exam in next Wednesday, and she all the way have come from Pondicherry, so we should. <laughs> I had exam on Friday also. Ah, on Friday also, yeah. Yeah, so any questions you have? <laughs> for the exam. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Uh, for, for the last uh, two days, uh, all of you are making movies, right? So there is a reason why we ask her to take the trouble to come here. Also because, you know, she did excellent science as a cubist, but at the same time, she made and showed that art and science really goes together. And she possibly made one of the best cube videos so far, with narrative, with method, with jokes, with music. I mean, everything is curated just like that. And also the message, you know, culture, collaboration, and continuity. You know, so that's what uh, this whole thing is for. It also tells you a lot about the reason why we're not so formal. Because the moment you get to things, you know, more formal, then things we are only interested in definitions. Because the objective is that you have to define yourself first and, and redefine the things. And that's the reason why at the end she also left it open that maybe it is still not the moina, whatever. Maybe you, you may still have to do some kind of things. And my uh, Daphnia challenge still goes, which has not been uh, proven. So I want to still challenge with the Daphnia challenge, which is, if you find a Daphnia in India, you'll get a prize, a big prize. Because it, it looks like none of the, uh, what do you call the uh, wild, what, you know, wild uh, uh, water fleas that you get in India have never been identified clearly as Daphnia. Well, uh, I mean, they, they have got, but uh, they have to prove things. Uh, you know, unless they prove it, they won't get the prize. Okay, like, like she did the proof. You know, you have to go to the extent, and finally, we want Subhajit to verify that it is actually Daphnia. <laughs> That's why we brought him here. Anyone has uh, run, want to say something beneath about the, your native, Daphnia or Moina. Last year, I uh, collected uh, bone water sample uh, from Bokaro, and I found something like looking like Daphnia. But that was when I observed it under microscope and identified that link, which Kajal gave that. Uh, then I found that that organism was belonged from Daphnia family. But that was not exactly Daphnia genus. So you won't get the prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would just like to continue on what Jayan was saying. So he said that uh, at Cube we have this uh, very informal culture, right? So I think that is what has helped Kajal over here in what she did. So we all were believing that uh, what we were working with were Daphnia, right? And uh, then she comes in and says that, OK, uh, I have done taken some efforts that let me say that this is not Daphnia, but this is Moina. And uh, this is something that never happens in, uh, in our regular system. right? Uh, you, in our regular system, we are never uh, allowed to challenge the, our mentors. Right? We just take it as uh, something written in stone. You just listen to that. But then because of this informal culture, she has been able to do that. Right? She very well challenged us, and we, we had to accept with what she had to say. Right? <laughs> so, so maybe we have a lot to learn from you then. But you said it should be accepted basically. Okay, I'm Sucheta, and uh, Kajol, I remember her. I think uh, she had come to Goa. Yes. 
and she was talking very excitedly about this Moina. And everybody was looking at her, uh, quite a kiddish child she was that time. And I can see the change in her presentation today. Beautifully presented, very professional, very clear. And that's what I liked about the comparison that I remember how she spoke then. And she was excitedly speaking. All of us were actually admiring her at that time. And beautiful presentation, Kajal. Congratulations and all the best to you. So now I will call uh, Dr. Subhujit Sen to continue this uh, Daphnia part two, Moina part two session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Are <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, Arunan, where are you out there? Thanks, Arunan, for inviting me to join this group. And uh, you know, uh, he added me to the Cube group uh, a while ago. And I've been a backbencher in the Cube Cube group because I kind of sit there and observe once in a while, go through because there are hundreds of messages each day. And so obviously, it's not possible for me to go through each and every message. But once in a while, I tell him that if there is something urgent and something that needs attention, please ping me separately and remind me that I should look at it again. So I'm sorry if I don't keep track of the cube group very regularly. But I try to kind of interact whenever I find time. Now, uh, so uh, this, this study also kind of uh, stemmed from my interaction with the cube group. And uh, I started uh, about two years ago, I started interacting with the cube group. And uh, slowly, I realized that there's so much potential in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, this model. What, what, if I, if that's what I want to call it, the the system, the ecosystem that Cube itself creates, I think is very exciting. So I congratulate both Arunan and GN for that. And uh, I think it has tremendous potential. And I think this is one of the what I'm presenting today to you is one of the poten ways in this potential ways this potential can be tapped, and hopefully. We can take these forward in many, many ways more than one. This is just one example. Okay, So uh, uh, this study basically uh, started from Jyoti's lab, actually. And Jyoti, uh, is a, uh, Jyoti Ramchandani is a professor at uh, University Department of Life Sciences. And I am a faculty at, uh, I'm a Ramalinga Swami fellow at uh, another institute, which is also inside the campus. But this institute is a co collaboration with Mumbai University and DAE. And DAE is kind of the parent institution which SBC, SET, IFR, BRC, all are part of. So um, uh, that's where uh, I, and my forte, I'm a sort of a, I've been working on epigenetics for about uh, since 2002, so 16 years or so. So uh, my forte is epigenetics. And mostly I deal with human systems and other model systems in epigenetics. So, when Moina came along, and I was interested in finding out why not Moina and what is special about Moina, so I kind kind of started asking those questions when Jyoti and uh, Arunan introduced me to the uh, to the Moina system, and uh, I also interacted at that time with some Skype questions, and we had some Skype uh, interactions with some uh, uh, with Kajal as well at one point of time I remember, and so uh, so I'll, I'll I'll take you through the story, so how it went forward, so uh, yeah, so here are just a few points as to, and, and I'm sure most of you are already familiar with it. The most important point is that to do to be able to do good science without having uh, too much infrastructure, right? Like uh, I don't think cap capacity to do science should be in inhibited by the uh, amount of money that you can bring into uh, add to science. So the, the, that's what India, as Indians, we have to kind of figure out. Yes, the Americans can do it better, the Europeans can do it better because they have the technology, but we have the will and the 
power of numbers, right? So how we can be different, how we can use ourselves differently to ask interesting questions. And so I think Cube has that capacity. And uh, we and so Moira is a great model system from Cube because it can grow with minimum infrastructure. It's almost transparent as an organism. All of you, and I'll show you that quickly as well. It has both parthenogenic and uh, part, parthenogenic and uh, sex, sexual life cycles. It has it has rapid growth. Uh, is there a point? Yeah. It has rapid growth, and you can almost get up to, per, per bottle, you can get up to 200 individuals within a week. And as uh, Kajal has mentioned, and several of you are also following up, it's a model for hemoglobin gene transcription. And it harbors DNA methylation. This is what kind of intrigued me when I read, read, about, read about Moina, that it harbors DNA methylation. And hence, to me, it was a good potential epigenetic model. I'll come to that later. So uh, just a little bit of background. As you already know, it was, uh, she already said that it was isolated from CHM College by her. And then for, for, uh, many studies were followed up by uh, Arunan and Jaikishan at, at, at HBCSC. And this train was uh, procured by Priyanka Parihar of VS College, which made its way to Jyoti Ramchandani's lab. However, that batch, unfortunately, as I've learned from Jyoti, had actually died out. So uh, another cubist, Sheetal Bhanushali, subsequently got a second batch of Moena uh, to Jyoti's lab. And subsequently, that is what is still surviving. And those were the, that's what this sort of, we, we took that strain and carried our studies forward. So Jyoti and I collaborated to initiate DNA studies in Moina, because currently, at that point, we were not even sure if it was macrocopa. And then uh, we wanted to sort of start off by first identifying whether it is macrocopa. And the best way to identify is not just morphological studies. Today, the gold standard has become molecular identification, because DNA cannot lie. Right? And this, this idea that DNA cannot lie is changing the way we think about human evolution. How, you know, there's this whole Aryan invasion theory, and every day you'll see a different paper coming up on mitochondrial genetics, on uh, nuclear genetics, on human genetics, and how that is changing our perspective, and how we are re-looking at archaeological data and re-understanding how human migrations work, right? So molecular evidence, which just cannot be falsified, is kind of uh, the, the uh, the kind of the one of the laws in biology, so to speak, if you want to call it, like what we call as the central dogma of biology. Anyway, so um, uh, so therefore we wanted to kind of take Moina to the molecular identification, so that by without ambiguity we could ta ask what species of Moina this is. In addition, it would tell us where this Moina came from, who is this Moina related to, right? So I will kind of end it on that note and tell you a little bit about that. So. When we started Moena culture, uh, now I know Cube has already standardized Moena culture in its own ways, but uh, because uh, a drop of milk, depending on the quality of milk, depending on the conditions of temperature and uh, you know incubation and all that, there is a lot of variation between cultures, right? So we decided that in order to be able to make this a little more streamlined, a little more formal, as uh, many of us would like to call it, we tried to take a little more formalized approach, right? So we looked at papers that had already worked on Moina and tried to see what kind of feed those kind of papers were giving, right? So when you want to, when you want to get into the field, you want to also see what other researchers have been doing, because you want to first co corroborate your findings with their findings to make sure that what you're looking at is true or not, right? If it matches others' findings and then you find something new, then that takes the field forward. So that's what we, when we looked into the uh, field, we realized that many people who were working on Moena were also using Baker's yeast, which is basically the yeast that you can buy off the market. So we tri tried to standardize Moena culture by using Baker's yeast, and currently it's been doing fine for the last two years at Mumbai University campus. We have optimized subculturing methodologies. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. We standardized a simple method of DNA extraction. Now, this was something that was the crucial sort of the Achilles heel to the project, because uh, Jyoti's lab had tried to extract DNA from Moena and had tried various insect DNA isolation protocols, but nothing was working to, uh, to very good efficiency. And so I'll show you, uh, in fact, they couldn't even visualize the DNA on the gel. There was that little DNA in, that was coming out from the extraction methods. The only they, way they knew that they were getting DNA was that they were able to later detect it with, by using a methodology that is known as PCR. Okay? It uh, basically amplifies the signal, so you can see it. So PCR was used, and they knew they were getting DNA, but they were not able to visualize the DNA itself on the gel. So we had to kind of uh, start with that uh, method and uh, devise a method that can now be used in almost any college. We, didn't we wanted to avoid kit-based methods. We wanted to avoid expensive uh, uh, stuff so that we can 
take it to the masses, take this kind of isolation to the masses. So now we can use this for almost any model system. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then finally, uh, uh, of how we took this forward to a PCR sequencing and then molecular identification of the species and then a little bit about epigenetics, which maybe I won't talk about today, but uh, it's, in, it's kind of can leave it for the discussion. All right, so Moina were cultured in 100 ml glass tubes with a cotton plug maintained at this room temperature, uh, Mumbai room temperature, and powdered yeast. So we used the uh, yeast pellets, we powdered them in a grinder, and we used about 0 0.06, gra 0.06 grams in per 1.5 ml. And the solution uh, was cleared, so basically we took the supernatant of that solution and to get rid of the clump so that we are only looking at yeast. We calculated the number of yeast that was there and uh, added that. We, so we uh, actually count the number of yeast under the microscope per ml. And so we make sure that we are standardizing the method so that tomorrow if somebody wants to replicate this method, they can do exactly this and reproduce our results. So reproducibility of results is very important in science, right? So that's why we are go going very methodologically, kind of you know, doing a very formal approach to science. So uh, uh, the supernatant was added to 60 ml of volume, and this is something that we kind of standardized as well. We realized that Moina was having a lot of batch-to-batch -batch variation. Today, if I grow Moina, tomorrow if I grow another batch, there's different rates of Moina uh, uh, sort of growth. So what we realized is that if we, there were two factors that we realized increases Moina growth or helps Moina grow better, okay? And two, one of those things was what is known as spent media. What is spent media now? Well, we realized that if we take Moena, previously grown Moena, we just filter out the Moena and just take the water from previously grown Moena and add 20% of that water to the new media. So if I take 100 ml, if I have to have a 100 ml culture, 20 ml of the old water I will take without the Moena, just the water, and new 80 ml of the new water I will take. So that's my new media. So this is called spent media, what is coming from the old media, okay? So this, is, these, this type of culturing is actually used widely in mammalian cultures as well, and this is called conditioned media. Because you're conditioning the media, essentially you're taking some signaling molecules from the old media, and you're adding it to the new media, which then allows the moena to grow better. Okay, so that's what we realized. We, we, are, we are standardized that to about 20% of spent media. So essentially 12 ml for every final 60 ml volume of the uh, final media, which is 20%. And the second thing we realized is that we all, so the th we kind of autoclave the water. Autoclaving is a process which is essentially to sterilize the water. I know many of you will be familiar with it. We sterilize it so that we don't want unwanted bacteria or unwanted infections to come through to Moina, right? So you want, it's not aseptic, it's growing under sort of room temperature, uh, non-aseptic conditions, but at the same time, we don't want to keep increase the variability by adding new bacteria which we have no idea about. So that's why we try kind of do all of these pr procedures in autoclaved water. We maintain our cultures in autoclaved water so that no new bacteria, at least not anything that we don't know of, can come through. So, and the other thing we standardize is that it requires aeration. So obviously Moina requires oxygen, which we know from the hemoglobin experiments. From there, we realize that, okay, maybe if we add aerated water, it will grow better. And clearly, if we compared our cultures, aerated water versus non-aerated water, the aerated water gave much better results, okay? So we kind of shake the water overnight before we use it for Moina culture. So just shaking it on a, on a, on a shaker overnight helps, is good enough for aeration. So that's what we use. So these were the standardizations we added to our methodology for growing Moira. And we, now we have consistent uh, growth. And so this is the number of yeast cells that was added per, Moina, per ml of Moina culture. About that many yeast cells per ml of Moina culture was the optimum. So Moina grew to saturation within a week per tube. And uh, we could harvest about 100 individuals uh, per tube, OK? Uh, I mean, about 100 to 200 individuals per week we could easily harvest. So uh, this is just a paper from uh, uh, 2010, which kind of helped us uh, identify that this is Moina by using uh, uh, morphological characteristics, which Kajal had already hinted to, but we wanted to go uh, from a more formal approach. So we kind of looked up several papers that talked about Moina. And what this talked about was this particular feature. And they said, so this paper identified uh, this particular, this particular species is from South America. And uh, they were identifying this using morphological characters, okay? By morphology, I mean the way it looks, right? So you can see that this particular, co uh, what is known as the uh, setae, or, or toothed comb-like structure, 
is what was unique to Moina for one of its limbs. Only one of its limbs has this particular characteristic. And that what, that's what identifies it as Moina macrocopa. Okay? Now, this is again a morphological identification, so it has its falsifiable properties. It's possible that there is a new species out there which is not Moina macrocopa, but still has this property. Right? So therefore, it's still falsifiable. So we, we went ahead with this and first, and so we kind of looked at our uh, species. So this is our species of Moena that we, we got from Cube. And this is just a comparison to show you. Uh, so I'm ba I basically put the Moena on a slide. And, and what you're seeing is I'm going to take it through different planes of focus. to uh, So you can see that this is the uh, legs of the Moena. What you see here are the legs of the Moena, which is actually at the bottom of the Moena. And now as the uh, planes of focus will move forward, you'll see that this, these two are the antennae of Moena, the two big large antennae of Moena. And this part, as you can see, is the, where the gut comes. So you can actually clearly see the gut, right? You can see the gut coming out, and this is where the gut actually comes out. And this typical feature, which is, again, uh, typical of these crustaceans, is this uh, uh, hook-like structure, which is basically the abdominal uh, uh, claw. Okay? So uh, in fact, I think uh, you, you probably will be able to see that this Moena will actually poop in the medium soon. Now it'll, it'll, you'll see this contract, co contracting anus, and there it goes. Right? So it, it even poops. So you can see, we, can, we can see that it's actually a properly functioning organism. It's a completely transparent organism. And the advantage of this is that I can actually do a lot of developmental biology with this stuff as well, not just epigenetics. There's a lot of stuff you can do with this Moena because it's completely transparent. You can do developmental biology of the gut, the eye, the antenna, multiple things. Right? All right. So uh, this is just a, a zoom-in picture. This is a static picture of the same organism. So these are the antenna, the two antenna that were, you were observing before. This part is what is the abdominal carapace. And you can see these hairs, which is, again, typical of Moena. There are usually about 40 to 50 to even 70, depending on the type of strain or species that you are looking at. So we saw that the, Moena, the genus Moena has this carap hairy carapace. Uh, and that's your abdominal hook right there. And, uh, and these are the limbs, okay? So here is one limb, there's another limb here, and there is one more limb here, which is not quite visible because of the layers, so you can't see through it. But anyway, so let me take you through the, sorry. Oops, uh, I went too far. Okay, so, So these are the, uh, the, those are your antenna and the abdominal claw. And this is the carapace with its hairs. And finally, this is where the proof of the pudding was. As far as morphological characteristics, characteristic is concerned, this is the first limb of Moena, the first limb that you can see here. And the first, the most distal uh, part of that limb, there are several uh, appendages on the first limb. The most distal appendage, which is here, is the one that has the toothed CT, and that identifies it as Moina macrocopa. Okay? So this is what morphological identification gives us, and this is a clearer picture of the same thing, because then we dissected the Moina out and put it on a slide to be able to get a very clear picture of the toothed CT. Okay? So this, this kind of concludes that morphologically we can identify it as Moina macrocopa. Now, the pro so the, as I said, the nail in the coffin will be the molecular characterization. And this is where we get into DNA identification, right? So published protocols for Moena, which when we looked up several published protocols, there were kit-based insect DNA protocols that were used, and non-DNA-based, non-kit-based protocols which required liquid nitrogen. Now, obviously, liquid nitrogen is hard to come by for every laboratory in the undergraduate uh, scenario. Plus, uh, it's also difficult to handle. It's, it'll burn you. It'll give you cold burns if you're not very careful with it. So we decided that maybe we want, and in CBS, where, where I am, we have liquid nitrogen on a daily basis. So it's not difficult for me to isolate using this particular method. This particular method was known by, published by this group called Doyle and Doyle. So it's known as that method, known by the Doyle and Doyle method, the liquid nitrogen method. And uh, the, uh, we, we, so we, since this was the gold standard in the field, most people were using that method. We decided to use that method and compare that with a new method that we could create in the lab without using liquid nitrogen, right? 
So uh, the aim was to devise a cheaper, user-friendly alternative to DNA extraction for moin orchestration, and all crustaceans for that matter. This methodology will work for most all crustaceans, and probably for any new model system that we uh, look for as well. So what is it that we changed? So uh, we basically, uh, these were, uh, I've already talked about this. So what we did was we took about wet weight of about half a gram of tissue, and we, uh, we, we added porcelain. Now, where porcelain is something that all of us can uh, get easily, right? You b break a cup in the house all the time. You just grind it up to really fine powder. And that fine powder, you, we, we usually in the lab, we are kind of a little careful. We size it down and all that, but it's not necessary. You get, get a really fine powder of porcelain, and then you can use that to as a grinding material for Moena, okay? So we add about 1.5 uh, to 1.2 grams of porcelain powder per half a gram of Moena. Oops, I have, uh, this always goes back. Okay, so, so this was crushed in a particular kind of buffer, and this is now something that uh, CTAB is a buffer that is usually, was also used in the Doyle and Doyle method, and we added some other detergents. Now what detergents do is essentially they help break open a cell, okay? So there are different kinds of detergents which have different strengths, and therefore we used a mixture of detergents to be able to break open the cells of Moena, and we uh, were able to ident isol help isolation of DNA. And finally, we used an extraction based on the, which is a very popular old method of extraction, which is basically using phenol chloroform isomal alcohol, this is a combination that can be easily bought off the shelf of from a laboratory like SRL laboratories or something, and that's the material we use as well, and it's not very expensive, thankfully. I mean, yes, it's uh, once you buy a bottle, it'll last you for at least a year or two, depending on how many DNA extractions you do. But it's, it's not too, too difficult to come by in India, at least for now. So we use these things, and phenol chloroform isomal alcohol essentially removes the impurities. Okay, so when you want to isolate DNA, you want to remove the carbohydrates, you want to remove the proteins. So phenol chloroform isomal alcohol is basically a mixture that takes care of removing, removing these impurities from DNA. So uh, and this is what we got from this extraction method. You can, so this is the liquid nitrogen comparison, the Doyle and Doyle method. This is just the same sample in different dilutions so that we could quantitate it as well. So this is gel-based quantitation. What you're seeing here is a molecular weight marker. So this is 21 kb, okay? 21 kilobases and 5 kilobases and 4 kilobases and so on. And you can see that the genomic DNA that we get is pretty good quality because it's all high molecular weight. And the second thing that we notice is that from the liquid nitrogen method compared to our method, which is the porcelain method, we don't see the smear, right? So in our hands at least, it seems like compared to the liquid nitrogen method, the porcelain method is working better because we are not getting this shear of DNA. Okay, somehow liquid nitrogen is also shearing the DNA further. And so what we are observing DNA on a gel. I don't know, are, are, are you, is everybody familiar with DNA on a gel, how DNA should look on a gel? So D gel is basically a agarose gel. It's a matrix, it's like a three-dimensional matrix. And we, DNA migrates through the gel in the presence of an electric field. And based on the size of the DNA, because it's moving, because DNA is negatively charged, we apply positive charge on one end and negative charge on the other end. So because DNA moves from negative to positive, as it migrates, it is, Migrate, the larger pieces will migrate slowly, gets retarded, and the longer pieces will migrate, and shorter pieces will migrate faster. So that's how you get this typical mobility, and this mobility, if you look at the uh, values, you'll realize that it's not linear, okay? In fact, if you plot a graph, this is a logarithmic uh, relationship between the move, movement of DNA on the gel versus the molecular weight of the DNA on the gel. And usually on a gel, the resolution of DNA movement is about 12, to 13 kb. Beyond that, the resolution is really poor. So in this range, we are not able to kind of exactly get the molecular weight of this DNA, but we know it's very high molecular weight. Everything above 12 or 15 kb is going to move together, okay? So we know that we got good quality of DNA, and then we have better quality in terms of the shearing as well. And when we compared by quantitation based on these markers, we can quantitate the DNA, and when we quantitated it, we saw that the porcelain method gave us almost twice the amount that compared to liquid nitrogen method. So it was not only better quality of DNA in terms of shear, but it also was good, better quantity of DNA. All right, so we finally had good DNA in hand. Question is that now that because we have used a non-kit-based method, is this DNA good enough for our molecular studies or not? Because the DNA could be really bad quality as far as once you extract it, maybe it's not good enough for sequencing, maybe it's not good enough for PCR. There are a lot of molecular techniques that need to be tested before we go ahead for, DNA, for 
sequencing, right? So that's the series of tests that we do. This is one typical uh, test that one does. It's basically a restriction enzyme assay. You take a restriction enzyme and you cut the genomic DNA, and the genomic DNA has random restriction sites all over the genome. And these sites, when they cut, you get a smear, okay? So you can see here, this is an uncut piece of DNA. When we cut it with eco R1, which is a restriction enzyme, it get, gives a long smear, okay? Because there are lots of varying sizes of DNA that come, and they all merge with each other and look like a smear, okay? There are many, many, many bands here. And similar is the case with another enzyme called Hindi 3. So clearly our DNA was digestible, and both the samples were digestible, but of course the original, the uh, Doyle and Doyle method had this smear, background smear that we had to deal with. So we, we kind of skipped that method henceforth going forward. What we then asked is that, is this DNA ligatable? What is ligatable? Ligatable means once we have cut with restriction enzymes, which is like a scissor, it's a molecular scissor, once we have cut with restriction enzymes, can we stitch them back together? Okay, so ligase is an enzyme that stitches DNA back together, and you can see here, these are the cut fragments, okay? Eco R1, Hindi 3 smears, you can see, and when we ligate it, you can see that they are going back to the original size. In fact, they are going even higher molecular weight that, that, than that. You can see this background smear here, right? So in fact, it's going, it's ligating to much higher molecular weights than the original uh, uh, sample itself. So that showed that the DNA was not only cuttable, but also ligatable. And the last thing we did, of course, which is PCR, because this is where we can now look for a, a candidate gene and then sequence it, right? So we performed for two genes. One was the cytochrome oxidase gene, which is well known for characterization of Moina, which a lot of other people have used. And the other gene was the hemoglobin gene, which Jyoti was interested in as well. So we designed primers for these. We designed what are known as degenerate primers. Let me not go into those details, but those designs are molecular designs. We can, if somebody's interested, I can talk to you about it. But we designed primers against those and then finally amplified and we got the expected sizes from Moina. And so these primers were designed based on the Daphnia sequence. Okay, so, but we were able to get similar sizes from Moina as well. And now the question was that can we sequence this and identify whether this sequence, this gene that is coming from our species, is it truly Moina macrocopa or not, right? And so our, um, so we, we, we looked at these two genes. These two genes are the ones that actually helped us identify that it was Moena macrocopa. This is the cytochrome oxidase gene, and this is a region that is normally used widely for what is known as DNA barcoding. Barcode is something basically, you, you, when you're buying something at a supermarket, everything has a barcode, right? Which identifies that particular product. Nowhere else in the world will you find another product with the same barcode. That's why it's called a barcode, right? So DNA barcodes are essentially sequences of DNA that can be used to identify that organism or that strain, okay? So, that's, so people have done lots of studies of DNA sequencing on different organisms and come about with this region on the genome, which is a 5S RNA, 5.8S RNA. There's a particular region on that region uh, which is unique for that particular organism, right? So people use that region for barcoding multiple new species as well. So we use that species and the cytochrome oxidase gene, and we carried out these set of things and finally ended up at sequencing and got sequence for both of these genes. And both of these genes have now been submitted to GenBank. Now what is GenBank? GenBank is a repository of information that is there maintained by the US, uh, by the National Library of Medicine, LLM. And like, this is basically where everybody in the world, whoever sequences any new gene, will submit this information to, so that that information is now available to everybody free of cost, right? So we submitted all of these informations to GenBank, and this is something that we are still currently working on because we have still got partial sequences from there. We have yet to work on that to get full sequence. So this is, an, uh, this is what you can look at GenBank. If you just Google on your phones, Moina Macrocopa, India, and we have named the strain JSK, Okay, uh, for some reasons, but let me not go into that. But idea, uh, so we have called this, we had to give a strain name because uh, GenBank requires you to provide a strain name. So you call it JSK1. So if you give Moina Macrocopa and JSK1, you should be able to get both these GenBank entries on from Google, okay? So this is how it looks. It tells you all these details. It tells you that uh, somewhere in India is mentioned, yeah, here. It tells you that this is coming from the country India. This was done in Mumbai. And it tells you, uh, gives you the DNA sequence that we had submitted and gives you the protein sequence from the DNA that is predicted, okay? So it gives you that information. 
And finally, what we did, this is the what is what is now known as a molecular phylogeny. Okay, this is what identifies. This is the kind of the nail in the coffin. It cannot be refuted once you do these studies that what this is about all about. Where is this moena coming from? Right. So we did the study. This is basically what is a uh, when I told you that when you do human migrations, you compare genomes of DNA, right? From this species, this hum, uh, human uh, population and that human population, and then understand how these populations are related based on their DNA sequences. So a lot of studies have already gone into building these programs that can measure evolutionary diversity and evolutionary distances between populations. And when we looked online at NCB, uh, at this GenBank data set, there were about 260 odd Moina COI genes already submitted from all over the world. Okay, so since there were 260 genes already available, but none were from India. So ours seemed to be the first gene COI gene sequence from India, Indian populations. And when we matched that, when we matched that, we saw that it clubbed with the Russian population. So you can see that. These are from South American populations that has a different uh, uh, common ancestor compared to the Russian population, which has a different common ancestor. Ours, our Moina, falls under the Russian clade. Clade is basically a group. These are terminologies we use in evolutionary biology. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is that this belongs to the Russian family, or the one that is found in that, that, is, that Cube is using. Okay? So this is something that we have now found out. And now we are kind of trying to understand a little more about the variation in this species and hopefully carry forward this to some epigenetic studies as well. So I'll kind of uh, end it there. And if people have any questions, want to know a little more about epigenetics, I, I can uh, talk about it. But I think I've already taken more than my time. So yeah. So we are also kind of write, uh, writing all these studies up. The manuscript is in preparation. A cost-effective DNA isolation strate strategy from crustaceans enables the first molecular phylogenetic identification of Moena macrocopa from India. So we're kind of still writing up this publication, putting all these studies together, and we'll submit it soon, hopefully. So Sheetal and uh, Kritika. Sheetal was one of the CUBE students who got the strain and continued it. And Kritika was also a student from, with Jyoti. And both of them. Uh, essentially did all the groundwork for this project. Thanks. Thanks, Sujit. So I think Sujit has very well, in very simple words, uh, explained what work they have done in their lab. I think uh, the, the language was very simple even for every, everyone over here to understand. So if anyone of you have questions regarding his work, please, questions or comments? Uh, so you used the uh, wet tissue and porcelain. So then you centrifuged it, or uh, yeah. So we we cleared the tissue before. So when once we what we do is first, I, if I tell you the method, essentially what we do is we take the porcelain uh, powder, yeah. we add it directly to the wet tissue, and we make a paste out of that first. Okay. By pistol and mortar. P yeah, apna Ayurvedic yeah, standard yeah. crystal, okay. you know, mortar pestle. Usme we make a paste out of it. And once we make enough paste so that we see that there's no like large clumps or something, because with the visible eye, that's what you can do. Then we add the lysis buffer, which contains your detergents. C-tab, there's multiple other detergents, deoxycholate and all that. But those are all simple detergents, easily available. You can just do it with SDS and C-tab as well, and it will work. Okay? So SDS is sodium dodecyl sulfate, and C-tab is another buffer, which takes care of carbohydrates. Okay? So these two are then added. And one, then we take that lysate that forms, again, sort of crush it with the detergents. And that lysate, we clear it by centrifugation okay. before Thank we you. take it to the next step, which is phenol chloroform as well. Yeah. Uh, eight minutes. Take it. Let, let, let us take it. Yeah, sure. Um, sir, you are, uh, you are sequencing hemoglobin gene now, right? So how are you extracting the hemoglobin? Uh, we are not extracting the the, the protein or the heme itself. We are okay. looking at the DNA, right? Because we already have the genomic DNA with us now. Yeah. We can just PCR whatever we want out from that. Okay. So if anybody has any other gene that they are interested in, mm -hmm. we can, of course, designing primers, figuring it all out, how to go about attacking that gene or p amplifying that gene. But we can now amplify any gene from Moena, whatever is known for Daphnia, for example, because the Daphnia genome is already published. Right, Moina genome is not published. So maybe that's another way we can go. We can just sequence the whole genome now. Mm -hmm. right? And we can publish this as a first Moina whole genome 
sequence. Yeah. So we are thinking of all those things, but yeah, we need money for that, so it's a process. We need big cards. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, money is not going to solve it. Of course, we need people to do the work as well. As you can see, Sheetal and Pritika, they did, the, did all the work. I'm just guiding them. So uh, which uh, epigenetic, me epigenetic mechanism are you working on? Means, uh, so in our lab, to? in our lab, we kind of uh, uh, work on uh, cancer epigenetics, broadly speaking. But cancer epigenetics obviously has to be studied in human model systems, right? Now, uh, what, but what, let, let me, I have a slide for just, since you asked, let me just go straight up to, ah. So the interesting, so this is the evolutionary tree of life, okay? What this tells you is that we, this is when the Earth was born, and this is at Earth today, timeline, okay? So this is deep time. This is what is known as deep time in evolutionary biology. So if you look at the deep time, you'll see that bacteria and all these unicellular organisms evolved long ago, and then came the plants and fu fungi and all of that, and then finally the all the animals that we see on the, on, in the world today. So all of this that is mentioned on the top here is what exists today, what we see, right? What we know from this evolutionary tree of life is that even though, and human is right, right here at the edge, right? So if, even if I want to study human, and because of this evolutionary tree that I told you about, and DNA sequences are related, protein sequences are related, I can now look at, depending on the process of life that I'm interested in, suppose I'm interested in neurobiology, then I can actually go far as far as wherever I can find neural systems and go far to those model systems and still study those model systems and find relevance in humans because they both share a common ancestor. The advantage with epigenetics is that that root is all the way down here. Okay, epigenetics evolved very long ago. So it can be even done in unicellular eukaryotes and we are now trying to study a model system which is in the lab for the last five years, we have been using a model system that is a green algae, that is right here, called Chlamydomonas. And Chlamydomonas has all the three epigenetic pathways that human system has, for which, which we have found out are involved in cancer. Okay, so we know that, from our studies, we know that the environment can change the epigenetics, which can drive normal cells to become cancerous. So we now know the molecular mechanism of this. So we are trying to see in Chlamydomonas, which is a much more ancient organism as far as, I mean, it's not ancient, it's there today, it's not a fossil, but because it has ancient correlation, we are asking whether there is a common root between how cancer forms in humans versus how clammy does its normal biology. Right, so that's what we are kind of studying right now. So now Moina, because it falls somewhere up here, it becomes a nice bridge between these systems. Right, so that's what we hope to achieve eventually, to see whether DNA methylation, which is involved in cancer, can it all, is the Moina DNA methylation somehow related to cancer DNA methylation as well or not? So that's kind of the broad picture that I, that where we are going with epigenetic uh, regulation. So uh, you are only focusing on uh, methylation, and not no, 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 the, all the three pathways. All the three, acetylation yeah. also. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, there are there are multiple pathways. Okay. I'm not going to the details, yeah, yeah. but there are three, uh, actually four, four broad pathways, out of which. Three are more fundamental. One is DNA methylation, one is histone acetylation, one is histone methylation. Okay, so these three pathways are more fundamental to the way genes are regulated. So we focus on these three pathways. So uh, in here we are trying to use uh, inhibitors to inhibit the pathways and then we try to conclude it that, uh, yeah. So are you also following the same? Yeah, yeah we do all of those similar studies as well. Yeah, okay. we do similar studies as well. New culture, and you talked about the, there. There are the few signal molecules. So, what are the signal molecules? Well, obviously, we don't know because we haven't done a metabolic study for that. So, there is that's possible today because there is this instrument that one can use, LCMSMS. Essentially, what it does, it it will map the metabolites that are in the supernatant, and you can identify them. And how they can help? How they can help is something that is a matter of study. Question is. Uh, somehow the Moina probably has, so this is now there in mammalian systems as well, right? If I, gr take, if I take a group of cells, say 10,000 cells, and grow them in mammalian culture, they will grow very fine. If I take these 10,000 cells and isolate them to single cells, those cells will die. 
Yeah. Okay, so this is what is known as signaling of autocrine and endocrine signaling, right? So that means the cells are also producing some signaling no, for themselves. But, but here is not the matter of cell, here is entire organism. Right, which is what is surprising, right? What we feel is that Moina must have sensing mechanisms. Our experiment suggests that Moina has sensing mechanisms by which it can sense whether it has other populations around or not. Right? Right, people do that as well, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't want to make statements because where, where I don't know what the molecules are, but I know that a conditioned media is definitely better than non-conditioned media. We have done those control experiments and figured that out. Uh -huh. I just, uh, from this actually, the connection I can, I was just asking that, uh, no, uh, uh, in uh, eukaryotic organisms we know, but what about like uh, something like phage? So, uh, is there any epigenetics? So, uh, this is where the line uh, becomes fuzzier between epigenetics and transcription, right? And uh, something that I have talked to you and some cubists out uh, about it before as well, that uh, there is a difference in transcriptional bio transcription biology, which has been studied for the last 50 years, 60, 70 years now, and epigenetics, which was which had remained dormant until the 80s and 90s, and then suddenly became very popular as a post-genome era science. Since the 2001, the human genome was sequenced, then we started asking, okay, this is a long sequence, and it looks like every cell in our body has the same sequence, yet how is different cells having, you know, the skin cell looks completely different and behaves completely different from a kidney cell and so on and so forth. So what is the difference between just transcriptional programming and epigenetic programming? And of course, there are molecular correlates and we understand those differences today. Mm -hmm. What we know is that in phages and bacteria, the kind of regulation is more transcriptional regulation, okay? It is less epigenetic in nature. In fact, it is non-epigenetic in nature if you want to call it that. The problem is, with, is again with these formal definitions. Yes. Okay. The problem is that both are can can have memory. There is transcriptional memory and there is epigenetic memory. However, transcriptional memory can be easily erased. And epigenetic memory is a little more faithful depending on which pathway you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So DNA methylation versus his histone methylation versus histone acetylation, they have different plasticities. Plasticity is basically the ability to change it. Right. So. Epigenetic regulation, we know, for example, in, in other model systems, they can go up to eight generations, mm -hmm. right? However, that is not true for phages and bacteria. Yeah. They don't go up to that many generations. Okay, I just want some, yeah, the, some technical uh, questions were there. You know, how do you first like decide the uh, uh, amount of DNA? Like you want the band on the you know, gel, yeah. but then we should be very sure that you know uh, when you are uh, uh, taking out all the DNA, hmm. uh, it should form a band. It should be visible band. Correct. So how do you like decide that uh, amount? I mean, how, how so to decide that? We, we, we calculated the amount from this, uh, so because we la ran a molecular weight marker as a uh, ruler, molecular ruler here. And you can note, you see, so basically this is how this marker is created is that you take lambda DNA, which is a phage, mm. and you cut it with two enzymes. In this case, it is equal or standard Henry available, yeah. This is a standard pr process. But what happens essentially is that if you take a long string and you're cutting it into different sizes, you are maintaining the molar ratios of each size, right? Each size has the same number of molecules. But because the sizes are different, the quantity of DNA in each is different. Yes. Right? So although the molar ratio of each of these bands is constant, the quantity of DNA in each of these bands is different. So I can therefore create a correlation between DNA quantity and fluorescence intensity. Right, so I, we have done, of course I can show you these graphs, but we have a graph now which has a straight line. It's a logarithmic uh, semi-log plot. So there's a straight line. And now because I have a standard curve, I can now deduce the unknown concentration of DNA from that standard curve. So you take any amount of, you know, moina, you crush it, for example, if I, if I do any amount and I crush it, then I will get some DNA. Correct. And then I will run a gel, then I can come, come to know what was the amount of DNA which is uh, present into, Correct. into it. Like the advantage that, of doing a gel-based method yes. is that because DNA, uh, if you, the, mo the most popular method in colleges many people use is UV absorption. Yeah, yeah. The problem with ethidium UV absorption bromide. is ethidium that bromide, no? ETBR. This is ethidium bromide. This is but, ETBR. Huh? But UV absorption will also calculate RNA, right? Because nucleic acids, everything will absorb amino, uh, will absorb UV. Mm. So it doesn't differentiate between RNA and DNA. And but usually DNA has some RNA contamination, right? So that's why we try to use ethidium bromide. 
because it is a little more specific to DNA. Of course, it's not the best, but it's, the, it's as close as we can get in our labs. Okay, but you have already used the phenol uh, the, Does it not remove RNA, or no. you can use RNAs also, RNAs? Yeah, we do use all of that, but uh -huh. in spite of using RNAs, your free nucleotides are still in solution okay. with the DNA, yeah. right? So they will still absorb and give rise to absorbance. They'll contribute to absorbance. And uh, how do you like decide a gene? For example, you have sequenced two genes, no? Yep, uh, yep. One is of, uh, I just, uh, no, the, uh, cytochrome oxidase subunit, yep. and another is, uh, that is 8S, 8S mm. RNA, 5. not 16S, 8. not 5.8, uh, not 16S RNA, no. because uh, conven like right. conventionally, I know what is 16S yeah, yeah. RNA is. It's used for bacterial done. identification. So question is, which part of this DNA is the barcode, right? So how do, how you, do you define a barcode? Uh -huh. So people do multiple studies and analysis from those studies, and we have referred those papers and figured out that these regions are used for crustacean identifications. So That's every right. organism will have different sequence. Uh, different barcodes, yes. For RNA. Uh, for uh, this ribosomal RNA. Yes, for that region. There's a particular region. It's actually two regions. Uh, it's actually two genes, uh, 5.8s and 16s. And between that, there's an intergenic region, mm. which is actually the differential region. Okay. So and we amplified that region. And how, what about like cyto? How do you decide this cytochrome oxidase? Same, way, same only way. Why only because this? people have used it. There were 260 odd sequences of cytochrome oxidase okay. itself available okay. for Moena species. For Moena. So one organism, people have already decided, yes. no, what... Uh, because if they have done so much extensive, extensive study work. on it, it's okay. better to try and see whether how our fits into that pie, right? Correct. How is our, our a part of that pie? Yeah. And, and uh, primer designing and all those things, we how to, like, you come to know from these sequences itself? From the Daphnia sequence. Yes. So we, we looked at the Daphnia sequence because that genome is already available. Mm. And then we decide, compare it with some of the Moena sequences, and then try to understand which primer, which uh, nucleotides to use. Okay. So it's it's a process known as degenerate primer design. So mm. yeah, it's a little more detailed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a question there. Uh, so you have said uh, you studied the sensory mechanisms of. Uh, no, no, we haven't studied them. We, uh, we just use conditioned media to know that sensory okay. mechanisms probably exist. Probably exists. Yeah. See, I can't, unless I actually study it, I can't say for sure, right? Okay, okay. So no experiments have been done on it? No, we only know that conditioned media works better. That's all I, ha I can tell you. Okay. I do not know what sensory mechanism is working, but yeah. it makes sense because most organisms have what is known as quorum sensing, which means that there are molecules, soluble molecules that are given off by some organisms that a population can sense whether I have enough quorum around me or not. Okay, so there's, and this even bacteria does. Okay, so this is widely known in biology that quorum sensing is a popular mechanism to sense species around you. Because suppose, for example, if I don't have, so, and this is true for particularly sexual mating, okay? When a female is there, and it won't produce so many eggs if there are not many males around, right? So that's where pheromone biology comes into play. But this happens, this is true for even for many other features of biology as well, not just sexual reproduction. Yeah, so uh, we uh, like we were trying to make a phototactic assay for like uh, to make Moina a model for um, Parkinson's. So we were like uh, we were studying if it is attractive to uh, light or not. So uh, it's not like actually no literature is available to back the theory. So uh, I thought you are, when you said sensory studies, I thought you might have done something related to this or any other sensing ability of it. Uh, so of we, we observe the same thing that it's photo it's positively phototactic. Photo yes. Yeah. So how do you do that, sir? Like. Oh, I mean, if you just shine a light, we we don't. But, uh, we have not done any quantitative assays on this. Okay. So wh I have only presented what quantitative assays okay. we have done, and remember, uh, there are a lot of qualitative observations we can make. Mm -hmm. However, uh, and this is a, a different discussion altogether. We have to add quantitative nature to our qualitative assessments. Mm -hmm. Unless we do that, we cannot be sure, because humans have what is known as conf confirmation bias. So if I am believing that, OK, you know, this might exist, I might be able to, I might actually conclude that I, that does exist based on a qualitative me measure. Exactly. And this is a process of science, right? We have this process of hypothesis to observation to a full circle. But one thing we miss is that there is what is a part of modern science is objective identification. That you take yourself out of the equation and try to quantitate besides you observing it, whether that is quantitatively true or not. Only then it becomes less falsifiable. 
until it is quanti qualitative, it is more falsifiable. OK? Thank you, sir. So I think uh, I myself have one question. So this, is, this would be from a cubist point of view. So uh, at Cube, most of the students uh, grow Moina by using milk. You would use drops of milk. And for them, this is like the easiest way to grow Moina. Uh, now, when someone comes over here and says that, OK, uh, when we took it from Cube, we took the Moina from Cube, and then we wanted to come up with something more formal. right? So I think for a Cubist, they would have a question, why would that medium be called as more formal? What makes it more formal? So this, this has to do with, uh, am I loud enough? Can you hear me at the bench, last bench? No? I'll try to scream a little more. So, uh, color mic? Maybe a floating mic. Yeah. You have a color mic. Oh, I do? It's okay, that's fine. So essentially, this, this, this has to do with variation, OK? And this is why uh, physics, physical sciences and chemical sciences are different from biological sciences. And if we didn't have variation in biology, we would not exist today, OK? Evolution thrives on variation. And what has variation to do is with this word that we use in biology and, in fact, in our daily lives, OK, as to uh, normal. We say, oh, this is normal. OK, and then we, we, we just use it. And in English, normal, the immediate opposite to that is abnormal, right? Somebody, somebody already said it. So in, bio, in science, there is no abnormal, OK? It's, so what is normal then in science? And that's why this, what we do is why, why we do. What is normal in science is basically by, defined by its Gaussian distribution, its population distribution, OK? If you look at uh, any character, in this case, let's say, Moina surviving on its food source, OK? And I look at each individual in the population as to how good it survives. I will get, a, if I plot survivability here, if I plot survivability there, I will get a typical thing that is known as the bell curve, right? And this bell curve is what is your, what is known as, in science, is known as the normal distribution. And that is why we, we call things normal, OK? So this is uh, uh, basically numbers, OK? So uh, survival, again, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the number of organisms, actually. And this is the, uh, uh, the other. The other. Uh, depends. I mean, you can take any two traits and tra plot them on the any any trait and plot this. My essential my argument here is that uh, in biology there is something called normal distribution. Okay, I mean not in biology in any population study, whether you're studying chemicals or uh, this, there's always a normal distribution on how things happen. Now in biology that's more relevant because it is these trails that will give some variation to your data. Most of your data will behave in a similar way. But these trails will, is what gives you differences in your data. right? That's why you, duplicates don't match. That's why replicates don't match. And that's why we do experiments multiple times to be able to see whether the phenomena is fitting into the normal distribution or not. OK, when I use milk, I am increasing. When I use milk, I am increasing this variation because the quality of milk that I'm getting, the size of the drop that I'm adding, the type of bacteria that are growing based on that milk, are all added variations. So I am essentially broadening this bell curve by increasing the vari number of variables in my experiment. Okay? Therefore, to reduce the number of variables so that I get more reproducibility in my experiments, I try to formalize, that's what, what, what I referred to was, formalize the experiment in the sense that I know I define the system very well, that I know exactly this is there in the system and that is there in the system. As far as possible, I try to define my system. The more I define my system, the more normal it will become. OK? That's why I try to avoid the milk-based method. But the milk-based method is a great method for doing biological observations. Don't get me wrong. But maybe tomorrow we can do some standardization on that and figure out what does milk, what type of bacterial organ, maybe lactobacilli are growing, maybe a particular species of lactobacilli are growing. Maybe tomorrow we can do away with milk and just add the exact amount of lactobacilli and get the same uh, thing working, right? So things can be worked out. It's, it's a matter of asking the right questions. Uh, Subhajit, I want to uh, ask some epigenetic uh, questions. Yeah. 
a very naive epigenetic questions. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, I mean, so the environment does affect uh, uh, the gene expression. And uh, food is also one of the environmental sure. aspects of that. So uh, linking it to this discussion that is happening right now, so could some morphological features as well change because you are only growing them in yeast and not in lactobacilli. So, uh, uh, and, and so that's the kind of uh, uh, thing. So do you have that kind of any such uh, epigenetic uh, markers in the literature that one can take ex advantage of? So um, there are markers, not for Moina, but there are uh, such examples in uh, human biology, for example. Uh, one popular example I can tell you is height, right? Now, we know that, uh, in general, the Nordic uh, populations are generally much taller, like six feet and above. The average height there is six feet and above, compared to an Indian population, where it's five, five feet, six inches is the average, right? Sometimes even lower. If, it depends on the sexes as well. So uh, height, although has a normal distribution, if I take all the people here, you will probably fall in this distribution. There will be a normal of a Indian population falling in between, right? which height is in between. However, if your progeny or your parents had maybe, maybe in your childhood or when you were in the womb of your parents, had some malnutrition or had better nutrition, then that would also affect your height, okay? Later in life as well. So, uh, and this property goes with, for example, um, um, not morphological characteristics, but it is known for behavioral characteristics. Well, even morphology, to, to some extent. For example, it is known that if your mother or your grandmother was starved during their lifetimes or during their pregnancies, then the, their children and their grandchildren who have never faced starving will still tend to be more obese. It's a morphological characteristic. So yes, morphology is affected by epigenetics, but it is not a disappearance of a character or appearance of a character. It is only more pronounced character or less pronounced character. So what about the uh, example that we have in uh, Daphne uh, The uh, Moina. Uh, actually, Daphne Ampia. Okay. grows on the head, head region. So would you call that epigenetic expression? So uh, I, I'll have to look into it. So there's a, possible, uh, there, there's a possibility that these are not epigenetic in nature. They're transcription factor based, right? So it's possible that it's in inducing a transcription factor, mm -hmm. which is driving a mechanism that is inducing this new, uh, this. Uh, so, and this is true for uh, many, and so, the, the problem is, the, this, this comes back to what is known as uh, your, um, um, I'm forgetting the word now, um, your minim, minimal prin principle that you have to, uh, the most least complex principle that you have to ex use to explain the phenomenon, right? Oh, Occam's uh, razor. Yeah, Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Oh, yeah. So uh, this comes back to the point of Occam's razor, right? Because there is already well-known explanations that are genetic in, ba genetic in uh, basis for such phenomenon, transcription factor-based mechanisms, and which are already known. I would first start off with those hypotheses, nullify that hypothesis that doesn't hold true, then look for epigenetic mechanisms, rather than base my hypothesis in epigenetic mechanism because I don't know anything about epigenetic mechanism in other systems also. So I would start with a more simpler hypothesis, which has been proven in other model systems, and then go forward. Yeah, so this rigor is very important. You know, otherwise, yes. people may just completely confuse Absolutely. between epigenetic and transcriptive. Uh, 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 I would like to add to that uh, change in helmet shape uh, uh, when they are zebra fish in the tank, for example. So uh, it's something related to the signaling molecule probably that we were talking about. So there have been some research that uh, the Daphnia, they sensed the 
predatory pheromones that are called chiromones. So uh, in the water that, th that they are predators, uh, they will sense the molecules because every predator, even in tadpoles, uh, if they are fishes, uh, the, the fishes that eat those tadpoles, they can sense the signaling molecules that are called uh, chiromones, and thus they have this induced uh, morphological changes that we see in the populations that have uh, uh, exposure to chiromones versus the population that do not get exposed to chiromones uh, in their developmental stages. Right. And uh, in fact, recent studies, there are a very few studies on this aspect now, that this predatory mechanism that she's talking about. There are very few studies right now, but there are some that are already suggesting that predatory mechanism is one of the ways that epigenetic mechanisms can use to select for a particular trait. So this goes to our understanding of evolution. We are kind of re-understanding re re evolution that maybe Lamarck was not wrong after all. Okay, that environment can drive evolution from a, it's a more Darwinistic principle. We are still not uh, violating Darwinistic principles, but we are invoking that environment can directly affect the phenotype as well. And there are mechanisms in epigenetics that suggests that, okay, that those are possible. Of course, we have to ask those questions. Uh, I thought it's the opposite, no? Lamarckian was shorter than Darwinian, right? Uh -huh. But in the way how we are bringing them back, yeah. Uh, yeah. it comes out that it takes much more time to have the environment so, 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 so to bring it to this argument, for example now, if I were to say that, um, say Moina has developed a new feature now, based because of zeb zebrafish, and, or Daphnia, I don't know. Daphnia or Moina? Daphnia, okay. Daph okay, so Daphnia has this new feature. Question is, is this feature now heritable? Right? How long is this heritable? That kind of differentiates between a transcriptional program. Is it sensing something and inducing something? It's a transcriptional in a, uh, program. Or is it a heritable program that is going to help in evolutionary scales? And there, it might be epigenetic. So that's kind of the difference in mechanism we can invoke. Sure, sure. In fact, this experiment. Yeah. Sure, sure. Of course, it's a constant battle between prey and predator. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. So on evolutionary scales, we see this happening. It's. I didn't get you there. Sorry. Right. But that adaptation may itself change over years. Sure. Or how, how it is ever adapting. So it's not something that is continuous. So like you this brings a, me. Fix a feature that, OK, this is because of uh, No, so I think, I th I think we are change. on the same page. It's just that there are two, two possibilities in evolution, OK? Right. The two possibilities are, if you are looking at uh, trait importance, if I take two graphs, I'm plotting, it's OK. If I'm plotting two graphs, I'm plotting trait importance. In one case, if I look at the number of generations now, okay, so say up to 40, 40 generations in one in both cases. In one case, I'm getting a random distribution of trait. Okay, so there is no correlation between the appearance of the trait or the sort of the uh, uh, trait becoming better or worse. There is no correlation between the trait becoming better or worse, so it's random. And this is what random mutations will give rise to. Okay? However, so if there is natural selection on this population, this will look very different on the other scale, where you start seeing a typical correlation. And this is the what natural selection will do. This is adaptive selection. Okay, so what we are saying is true where as long as this happens, but the moment natural selection is there, the population will shift. So this is genetic drift and shift. Again, it will achieve. So it will go back to Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. But the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium can be disturbed by natural selection. Sir, how can uh, Dr. Sen, how can diapos and uh, parthenogenetic changes in insects uh, be explained epigenetically? Like we want a short uh, correlation. Is there any correlation we can give an explanation on? So uh, it is there. It is known for the fishes. Diapos. I, I, 
Uh, and parthenogenetic changes in insects, because that is also environment introduced. Right, right? I have used. not read much about uh, insects, but I do know that there are, there are examples that are known, epigenetic uh, reasons that are known in fishes. So for example, I, I forget the species name exactly, it's a flat founder, flounder fish, I think, if I'm not mis mistaken. Uh, and uh, these flat fishes, they change sexes based on their population around them. And that change apparently is epigenetic. So uh, there are examples such of such, such things in uh, fishes that I know of. I don't know if these examples exist in insects. But th it do, does exist in crocodiles, uh, turtles, where uh, epigenetics decides the sex of the individual based on the temperature at which the eggs are grown. So there are those variables as well. So how much that plays a role in human biology or insect biology is something that is, I think is still a question, open question. Uh, depending on the type of uh, mechanism involved, okay? Not, uh, not every mechanism. So as I said, there are three fundamental mechanisms to epigenetics. If I were to put them on a scale of heritability, DNA methylation is the most heritable, okay? Compa most heritable compared to histone methylation, compared to histone acetylation. And therefore, Histone aspiration has a very large overlap with transcription. So that's your, in simple terms, this can go on for, can be faithfully replicated for generations together. This can go off for a few generations. This can actually be rubbed, erased off within the same individual as well. But can also be transferred, but it's very, it's less plastic. I mean, sorry, it's much more plastic. Okay, so it has its gradations. And so how are they determined that? You can do experiments to, basically you look for the trait, how many generations it lasts through. What is the, so this is basically the penetrance of the phenotype over a period of generations. Okay. Did I say anything? We have only 11 connections from outside so far. So we want to increase that to as much as possible. So please send this message to all your friends and to the groups that we have so that other people do know that the session is live. Oh, we should have had it earlier. We should have told that long as it can be known. Sorry for that. It's OK. Thankfully, I didn't say anything too bad. No, no. I mean, regretfully, we had such a wonderful session, and it has not been yeah. Okay, so uh, since uh, the heritability of uh, epigenetic process was a, the classic case uh, which I came to know about was of the uh, high caring mother and low caring mother pups, huh. pups of the high caring hmm. mother and low caring mo mothers in my rats, I think. Uh, uh, the the Elucidation of that came because they they, they exchanged, mm -hmm. I, uh, exchanged the yeah. high caring mothers pups to low caring mothers, and the low, high caring mothers pups became high low caring mothers, and susceptible to schizophrenia and Parkinson's uh, yeah. and many of those. So also. so which essentially shows that uh, the and then there was no heritability of that. Uh, no. Uh, so uh, there is no heritability there, and there there they also identified it through trichostatin. I think probably the. Uh, yeah, that's an astrolytic uh, inhibitor. Uh, uh, inhibitor. So that's a very that's the classic case I, I, I read about. So which uh, very clearly shows that it is uh, not it it's it's you, transcriptional type of thing. Is it what's that? that so the, so this is uh, uh, in case of in such cases, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a muddling because there are two types of tr heritability now. One is somatic heritability, so it's intra-generational, okay? The other one is trans-generational, which is mother to child. Now, mother to child, of if you're invoking histoastrulation, is poorer. But somatic heritability from cellular generation to cellular generation is still not too bad. Okay, so now, what type of mechanism actually plays through? Is it trans-generational or intra-generational? 
or is it just transcriptional? Only molecular details will tell us that. I cannot, just by the phenomenon, I cannot decide that it is one or the other. So, so it's, it's a very exciting area. So some of these people were asking questions because they are involved sure, in that. Sure, I understand that. Yeah, uh, sure. So I think we should promote this. Sure. Uh, maybe associate with uh, Shubhojit. <laughs> so I think, I think this uh, really, uh, whatever discussion that we had now, OK, Apurva has a question. Sir, about uh, using yeast, are you just adding them in uh, water or giving uh, some feed to it also to it uh, for it to grow? Miss Baker is is just added to water. Yeah, we're given? just adding it to water, just okay. ma making a paste and then okay. removing the debris, the large clumps by mm -hmm. centrifugation and adding adding the single cell yeast. We count the number of cells mm -hmm. and we add it. So we have tried with uh, growing the yeast in fresh media mm -hmm. and doing it as well. That is also fine. However. Why, if this works as well as that, then why waste time doing that, right? So we decided to go ahead with the dry yeast as well. Oh, we cal look at under the plate. I mean, we put all the moena into a plate and just count them using a brush. How do you decide? Uh, when do you decide that the culture is happy? As and it's okay. It's like we, we followed well. it over time. We followed it over eight days. So we okay. at each day we calculate the number of adult and juveniles. So how do you distinguish that, okay, today the culture has gone bad? It's in, it's well, in I bad look shape. at the curve, right? So if I'm looking at, um, basically over a period of time, okay, say suppose uh, dotted lines is one, one type of culture and the solid line is the other type of culture. If I reach saturation, uh, both of them will eventually reach sat the same saturation, right? But if the dotted line is, reaches slower than the uh, than the bold line, then I can conclude that the bold line is growing better than the dotted line. Okay, okay. Like that. So depending on the condition, depending on how they for look at on a time scale, I can decide whether I'm getting better growth or poorer growth. Yeah, the problem was that you know, uh, like uh, the organism actually moves, and there are a sure. lot of after you see the uh, culture bottle, it will be like you know so crowdy. Sure. So I I was just asking like whether it is a sampling method you follow. Any so what we do is we 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 just shake the bottle up completely, homogeneous, and then we take a quick sample, huh. immediately we filter that sample, and then count it off the filter. We, 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 we take a very fine, uh, I can show you the cloth as well. It's basically a very fine cloth. Even juveniles don't pass through that cloth. Okay, muslin and cloth, more than better. Muslin cloth is normally used, but. Yeah, uh, cheese cloth type of thing, muslin only, but oh. very fine muslin. Okay. So, that we, so we made sure that juveniles also don't go through that. Good. So, just. Uh, sir, um, for studying acetylation, histone acetylation, uh, you're using a NHDAG inhibitor, right? We can, yes. We yeah. have been using, yes. Yes. Uh, so is a similar mechanism, like similar protocol for, followed for studying histone methylation too? Sure. There are the inhibitors same. available for all three pathways. DNA methylation, histone methylation, as well as histone acetylation. So uh, for acetylation, we are uh, checking for the phenomenon of hemoglobin production. Okay. So even in uh, methylation also, that only phenomenon is? You can. You yeah. can technically check it in that phenomenon using an inhibitor for this yeah. or an inhibitor for this okay, okay. and compare mm -hmm. how the three different inhibitors affect the same, same yeah. this. And that might tell you something more about the epigenetic phenomenon. Yes. However, these other inhibitors are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem is that there are cheaper inhibitors available, but those inhibitors have much wider, what we call as off-target effects in mm, biology. Yeah. And because inhibitors have off-target effects, we have to be careful. We cannot directly conclude from inhibitors. We have to show at some molecular level to show that the inhibitor is actually affecting the molecule that we are looking at. Yeah. But the problem with using inhibitors, and therefore people do genetics, is because inhibitors have a lot of off-target effects, whereas genetics has slightly lesser off-target effects compared to inhibitors. Sir, uh, how do you distinguish between uh, like an effect, uh, uh, the effect of certain molecules based on uh, acetylation or methylation? Like, how would you know if it's acetylation or methylation? So an easy way, as I said, is using inhibitors, but the other way would be to do typical epigenetic assays 
which are uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assays. Okay. That's what we do in the lab. Uh, of course, it's difficult to do. It's not easy to do. Okay. Even in a laboratory like ours, we have to struggle, for, struggle towards standardizing many of these. But the idea is that eventually you have to, you know, uh, quantitate the science that you're qualitatively assessing, right? So the more quantitative your science gets, like chip assays, which are really quantitative, and then it becomes more le less and less falsifiable. Your data becomes less and less falsifiable. So you have to go in that direction. Make your data more quantitative in nature. If you're trying to do this by inhibitors, try to do it with statistics. Use larger populations, use multiple experiments, show the reproducibility. So the truth lies in numbers. Uh, the, the assay that you told, uh could you give a general idea how it's like, what it is and how it's done? Sure, so uh, what we do is, uh, so all of these modifications are on uh, pieces of DNA that are called, okay, so all of these modifications are on pieces of DNA that are called chromatin, okay? So chromatin is everything from here to here, okay? And these finally sort of make up that typical X-shaped chromosome that you see in your textbook. Okay? All of these kind of wrap up, and this part can make that X finally. Okay? Now, if you look at the molecular details, each, each nucleosome is basically eight histone molecules, and that is what wraps around a single piece, a single sort of a DNA wraps around that eight histones together, and this is called the histone optimum, okay? or the nucleosome, once it wraps DNA. So, what we do is we perform experiments where we ask the question as to whether a particular mark, histone methylation, or histone acetylation, or DNA methylation, is there on a particular nucleosome or not, okay? Why that is important is because this nucleosome, I think the marker, the, this guy, but basically the way a gene is positioned on this nucleosome is what is crucial, okay? So the gene has a start site, right, which decides from where it will get transcribed and when it will get transcribed. That start site is what is both very important. If I, I'll have another slide to quickly kind of show you what I mean by that. Uh, I don't think I have that. Okay. Essentially, uh, this is a very complicated diagram, but I'll simplify this, just block some of this. Yeah. So uh, this is where the start site of the gene is. So if the nucleosome, that, big, that ball, is bound to this area, then it simply works on the principle of occlusion, okay? Which means that it will block RNA polymerase to come and access this site. It's all about accessibility. All of epigenetics finally boils down to accessibility, okay? So essentially, what RNA polymerase cannot access that particular promoter, then that promoter cannot be transcribed. So that gene remains shut off or gets silenced. And the mechanism in, of the shutoff will decide whether, so basically I, by, by doing experiments, by doing what are known as chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments, we ask which promoter contains which type of nucleosome, which contains histone methylation, histone acetylation, or DNA methylation, right? So good, so uh, in this last 30 minutes of discussion that we had, uh, I think uh, a lot many connections came up. And uh, with what uh, Subhajit was saying just now, uh, in the last five minutes, uh, about the chromatin structure and the arrangement and accessibility, I think uh, this is what even uh, cubists who have been working on Moina have been dealing with in their work as well, right? So these are the kind of connections that even they are trying to make. Uh, and that, I think, is very uh, crucial, the, the, the kind of connections that they are able to make. So one thing is about this, of, about accessibility of the uh, DNA. The other thing is that uh, though they uh, use Moina as an epigenetic model, what they are actually doing is they are actually uh, relating it to concepts that they actually learn in their syllabus, like transcription and gene expression. Okay, so uh, though epigenetics as such is not directly uh, there as a topic in the syllabus, but then they are certainly able to relate that to uh, topics that are there in the syllabus of gene expression and all. And uh, like Subhajit, uh, with, with this discussion that we had, we also get to realize that, as in most cubists over here, would also realize that, okay, even by using Moina, uh, and even by studying epigenetics, they are able to uh, address uh, topics like evolution, which are very, very difficult to understand because the, we are talking about heritable changes, uh, what are heritable changes, uh, is epigenetics heritable or not, 
And uh, Subhajit also commented on about uh, transcriptional uh, regulation and epigenetic regulation. So, you know, somehow these uh, uh, these model systems open up uh, windows in understanding even concepts in evolution. We did. Uh, we also we also somehow touched upon topics related to biostatistics. Right, so we talk. We were talking about normal distribution. So in this last 20, 30 minutes, look at how many different topics that we have uh, touched upon, and that is the potential that these uh, model systems uh, hold. Right, so th yes, that, that's the dream of this conference. So we are really happy that we had this kind of a discussion. Thanks to you, Subhajit, that we could that you are actually making the qubits realize these connections. <laughs> uh, I have uh, noted down one more important message. Uh, and so one more challenge is thrown to all of you. If you have seen, uh, the, finally, the methods that were used, even, even after the DNA analysis, even after doing all the molecular techniques, the identification of the species also requires meticulous markers of morphological things. You know, I mean, who would want to look at the comb-like structure on one of the legs. Now, how could anybody do it if you are not actually carefully making a drawing of that when you are observing under the microscope? Because even if you take a photograph, you would ignore it. So let me, I wanted to tell you one thing. You know, biology is experimental science, but biology is also a drawing science. Don't forget that. The, the amount of uh, drawing that biologists do is the reason why they look and they're capable of looking at something that is important. So please don't underestimate the drawing part that actually happens in it. Of course, I know that it has been ritualized in our uh, journals that you have to draw a neat label diagram and things like that, and examinations also ask those questions. But look at this. I'm announcing a prize for those people who would meticulously draw every part of Moina and share it with our groups. Meticulously draw those things and confirm that they actually have seen those comb-like structures. I'm not only talk, not talking about the drawing of the comb, but there are so many other indicators on the surface and the morphology of the Moina. So please share beautiful, very neatly drawn pictures of uh, Moina, not just uh, beautiful doesn't mean colorful. Yeah, so all of you remember, drawing is the only way how a biologist can see changes and compare them with something else. It's an important skill that you have to learn, and I, I, I think uh, some of the drawings that you have shown, and also, uh, you know, in a, in a 3D, looking at the same organism at different uh, focal uh, distances. You know, and, and trying to see different aspects of that under the microscope. You know, and each of them will be another drawing. And also, even isolating uh, each of the components and making the drawings and things like that. So uh, apart from the video uh, uh, contest that is actually happening, so we should also have a drawing competition as well uh, so that we should be able to uh, promote among the cubists. So very important. It's also part of the reason that many physics students hate, hate biology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they, uh, and, and, and uh, it is good that we eliminated them. <laughs> uh, otherwise, they will show a formula for Daphnia or something like that and say, say, okay, the difference between Daphnia formula and Moina formula is so different and it makes it hell of a complex, <laughs> this thing. And of course, I mean, we, we have uh, many of these things. In fact, let me tell you, all the uh, biology happened because of technology. Uh, and uh, you know we, we, we should not ignore technology and mathematics and other things as well. Okay, yeah. so what is next? Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, there are some people who want to leave early today. They are uh, no, they have trains and all. So we will call those group first. So now I'm calling them. Uh, the, we are continuing with Moina group because I think there is Ranchi group which has to leave early. So I will call uh, Moina group which has to continue with the epigenetics uh, topic only, which we have discussed now. So please, uh, uh, Moina group, come and uh, just transfer the, yeah. So, so just uh, before you do that, uh, I wanted to tell you uh, that while the conference was happening, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, started this thing, 
uh, I actually started taking some notes uh, and uh, putting together some stuff here. As you could see, I, I'm really afraid of opening Shubhajit uh, and the conceptual richness that is actually happening out there. Because if I do that, you know, it will go to the third floor. Uh, um, there is actually no floors here. Actually, you can see uh, the kind of uh, richness of discussion that actually happened today. And, uh, and then, you know, you can see the amount of uh, conceptual combinations that actually took place here. Of course, this still needs a lot of organization. But the point is that uh, uh, this session that we had actually brought in almost every aspect of biology, starting from taxonomy to molecular biology to evolution to ecology to uh, behavior and uh, chemistry and physics and everything. So that, that's the whole important aspect of this. So what are we doing today? Context, which is Moina, OK? And curriculum. So the uh, and also the conceptual richness of that. So I want all of you to continue to do it uh, in 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 the, all the presentations today. So uh, and do take uh, notes so that uh, you know you'll be able to make the, the connections between context and the curriculum. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Apurva Satpute, and I'm from CHM College, Ullasnagar. And uh, we all are from uh, Mumbai and all areas. So there are some people from uh, Ranchi. Some are uh, also from Elphinstone College. So I will just introduce them. Uh, so I am Apurva. She is Aarti. I'm Aarti. Uh, Aarti from CHM. And then uh, Parnika and uh, Nehal from CHM as well, then from El Elphinstone. Um, so we are from Elphinstone. We are TY BSc Biotechnology. I'm Zainab. She's Shraddha. And we have Amay and Mansi. And we have Namrata. I'm Rachel. I'm Rachel Tirki from Q Branchi. And I'm a BSc student of microbiology from Branchi College. So basically, uh, we came two days earlier, and we were asked to make movies uh, on our uh, model organisms. And there were uh, three things to be included, and uh, mainly how we uh, make up, make the setups, then uh, how do we uh, make culture them, and what uh, research uh, topic or experiment are we working on. So our model is Moina, as we all uh, introduced. Uh, uh, so what we tried to do is we uh, made three parts of a uh, movie. And uh, in first part, we are just like uh, a movie type where a guy is inspired by uh, what is a Moina, and he tries to find it and so, stuff like that. So that is the first part. And he comes, he experiments it, and uh, he makes some goof-ups. Goof some of them uh, are, uh, means, so we wanted to show that some goof-ups can be uh, bad as, uh, as well as good. So that's what we were trying to convey in the first movie. In the second movie, we are uh, actually just showing uh, what hypo our hypothesis is uh, compared to the histone acetylation. And the third movie is in uh, experimentation, how uh, phototactic assay is related to the histone acetylation. Okay? So the second and third movie are uh, just uh, compiled and made just right now. So even we haven't seen them. <laughs> so it will be a premiere for our, us uh, as well. Yeah. And uh, also, the <laughs> because of time constraint, we haven't uh, fully edited. means uh, not uh, top level editing. So it's just like a normal one. So hope we all enjoy it. OK. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. 
later later. A few moments later.
Yeah, so in the first movie, what you could see is like, uh, first group of emics is using tap water. Okay, and all of them die. Responsible for maintaining the chromatin's shape and structure. Epigenetic modifications, such as histone acetylation, occur at the amino terminal tails of the histones that protrude from the nucleosomes. Acetylation of histones is generally acknowledged to play a key role in the regulation of gene expression. Histone acetylation is controlled by the balance and the activity of the two N. So he makes a group. Uh, so it's like he's making the setup from the start. Uh, means the experiment from the start. So he's inspired by it. He goes outside, tries to find moinas. He eventually gets them, and then he tries to culture them in tap water, and they die. So uh, then he's corrected by a friend, and uh, they say that no tap water will contain chlorinated water. So the bacteria will die. So what will the moina feed on? So that's one goof up, which was bad. But the other thing. He uh, adds extra amount of milk, okay, accidentally, and then he finds that they are turning red. So uh, that is, that is also a goof up, but is a, it is a positive one. Means uh, he got something new to learn from it. So we shouldn't uh, hide our goof ups. Is what the message in uh, in this video was, okay? And uh, also uh, in our cube lab, even uh, the phenomenon of becoming uh, they becoming red was found actually by this method. A uh, student from uh, school accidentally added two drops instead of one, and then that's how we got red moinas, the first uh, red moinas, okay? The histones are responsible for maintaining the chromatin's shape and structure. Epigenetic modifications, such as histone acetylation, occur at the amino terminal. Part two, part two. Yes, sir. Starting with the audio. Starting with the audio. No, it's not. 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 I don't know if you can see the video. I guess the video will be minimized. I guess it's not the same. I don't know.
should be same. They are doing it from this because the sound is just not coming pretty busy. So once this comes at that point. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the same uniform jack, right? There was a different jack, there was a different jack after that. For maintaining the chromatin's shape and structure, epigenetic modifications such as histone acetylation occur at the amino terminal tails of the histones that protrude from the nucleosomes. Acetylation of histones is generally acknowledged to play a key role in the regulation of gene expression. Histone acetylation is controlled by the balance in the activity of two enzymes, histone acetyltransferase, or HAT, and histone deacetylase, or HDAC. For a gene to be transcribed, it must become physically accessible to transcriptional machinery. Acetylation of histones by HAT causes uncoiling of DNA and an open chromatin structure. This causes genes to become accessible to transcription factors, allowing gene expression to occur and proteins to be made. Conversely, deacetylation of histones by HDAC results in tight coiling of the DNA and a closed chromatin structure. In some cancer cells, there is an overexpression of HDACs, an aberrant recruitment of HDACs, or an underexpression of HATs, resulting in hypoacetylation of histones and therefore a condensed or closed chromatin structure. As you know, our DNA is wrapped around histone proteins. Now, histone proteins are positively charged proteins. And our DNA, which is negatively charged, is wrapped around it. This is our gene of interest, which is the hemoglobin gene. Right now, as you can see, half of some of the genes are already wrapped around the histone protein. Therefore, RNA polymerase cannot transcribe the rest of the bound proteins. Therefore, the free proteins are transcribed. And you can see the proteins are being produced. While kept in hypoxic conditions, the organism requires more of hemoglobin. Therefore, histone acetyl transferase enzymes come into play and then they add some negative charges to the histone protein. The negative charges are added. Therefore, the, some part of the other part of the gene is released and RNA polymerase trans, uh, transcribes the rest of the genes also and you can see more molecules of hemoglobin being produced. When this red moiety is kept back into the 
color, uh, into the normoxic conditions, histone deacetylases are enzymes which come into play and they remove these added negative charges. Therefore, the, the, the gene is bound back to the histone protein, thus making the moena back into colorless. Or start it, or start it. Click on the button. Click on the button. Click on the button. Click on the button. To check the effect of palfrey acid on moina, phototactic acid was performed. The single moinas was taken in different test tubes and their movement was tracked. As moinas are generally phototactic, therefore moinas kept in 4 microgram per ml valproic acid were checked for their phototacticity by keeping the movement of moinas without valproic acid as control. The movement of moinas was tracked using the tracker software.
Okay. So basically, uh, to summarize what our videos want to, to convey is uh, how we culture means we are using it to, uh, for making uh, means experimenting and understanding the histone acetylation. So acetylation is nothing but uh, histone proteins are there we know uh, which are positively charged and DNA is negatively charged. So uh, there are enzymes which are produced under certain conditions and uh, which are responsible uh, means which are made under certain uh, environmental factors. So one such environmental factor we are dealing with in Moina is hypoxic uh, stress, that is low oxygen concentration in the medium. So as a result, uh, there is an enzyme called histone acetyl transferase, which will acid, uh, transfer an acetyl group which is negative and uh, on the histone protein. And as a result, the DNA will start to unwind. And now, suppose there are uh, some uh, some hemoglobin genes which were wrapped around the histone, were not able to express. Now they will be available for transcription. And thus, uh, they will produce uh, a more amount of hemoglobin, which will help them to overcome the stress of hypoxia. So that's how they are becoming red. And uh, this is reversible. If we add the red moina back into uh, a normal oxygen concentration, the another enzyme, histone deacetylase, will remove the acetyl group from the histone, and the gene will be again coiled around the uh, histone. And as a result, there won't be more production of hemoglobin, and eventually they will turn back to colorless. So uh, this phenomenon is uh, also means uh, checking uh, they are, uh, it is re easily reversible is also important, because uh, we can uh, clearly say it is not mutation, because mutation takes time. Whereas this process of uh, turning red and going back to colorless just takes uh, around four to five days uh, maximum. In our in our setups, what we, what we make, so and uh, mutations, uh, there is all a lot of chance factor involved for them to even occur and also to reverse back if they they can be reversed back. So that's how we are uh, uh, experimenting on understanding this. Yeah. So to confirm that uh, this mechanism is involved, what we are doing is the process where we add uh, red moinas back to into normog uh, normoxia, the histone deacetylase will remove the acetyl group. So we are going to inhibit that step. So uh, for inhibition, we are adding valproic acid, which is a known uh, SDAC inhibitor. So it will inhibit, and as a result, even in normal oxygen concentration, they will remain red, okay? So that's what our hypothesis was, and uh, students from Elphinstone okay. College have actually tried it, and uh, they have found that they remain red for nearly four to five days, I suppose. And then uh, we can uh, re-add uh, valproic acid if we want to maintain them as red for more uh, period of time. Okay, and then uh, they are also they found that valproic acid is also involved in uh, epilepsy that it is given to epilepsy uh, patients. So if uh, is the is there any application in that? So phototactic assay is nothing but the moinas are added to test tubes and they are checked uh, how they respond to light. So they should uh, they are positively phototactic, so they go towards the light. So how uh, if uh, valproic acid is added and uh, it inhibits, uh, means it uh, acts on the neurons, we expect that uh, this activity will be uh, altered, means they won't be able to go to. So that's how we, we want to uh, check the effect on behavior of the moina towards the, li the light and connect it to epilepsy, okay? So. Okay, so anyone? Okay, uh, that means uh, you use the term inhibitor. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, somewhat related to the gene expression, which we, the lactose uh, operon, I mean, can you just relate it with my syllabi? Because I'm very, I'm a school teacher, higher secondary, and I would like to relate it with the class 12 chapter, that is gene regulation. Yeah. Can you just explain the link lactose, lac operon, uh, or some, you know, somewhat, anybody can, uh, of you can explain this? Actually, lac operon, like uh, our Is it somewhat related to the inhibition and acceleration which happens there? Yeah. Lactose? No, uh, it is related as in uh, both are like, uh, like kind of same. Sim one can be used to understand the other. It is related in that, that mechanism. But uh, what we are hypothesizing uh, is that our expression is because of epigenetics. And in lac operon, what happens is a transcriptional molecule, that is a, 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 a repressor. Um, lac repressor and uh, allolactose, uh, these are involved. So uh, in ours, uh, like H, uh, the HDAC molecules is also involved, but they are acting on the histone level. 
this is directly acting on the gene level. The lacoperon is acting on the gene level. So it can be uh, like used to understand how the lacoperon is Is there is any analogy at the school level I can use Moina as my explanation? That's it. Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's what I was trying to. This can be added to your video. Yeah, yeah. You can. Yeah, uh, that kind of. An yeah, it is actually same. Uh, also, just like uh, they have got uh, promoter regions and exactly. stuff. So yeah, even in this uh, case, there are promoter regions and yeah. So, so it can be related. The accessibility to of the promoter yeah. regions. Yes. Uh, whether histones will allow the accessibility or not. That's the. In case of, see, lac operon is in prokaryotes, where no histones are involved. Okay? So there is no question of accessibility. It is just switching on. The moment the molecule is there, it switches on the genes, yes. the entire operon. OK, now my question is, <laughs> OK, so in the normal Moina also, do you find hemoglobin? Uh, yeah, uh, means we expect, how, yeah, little amount of hemoglobin uh, should be produced. Oxygen, yeah. right? So uh, okay. it is actually. So can uh, I not put it this way that there is overexpression rather yes. than. Yeah, yeah, yes. it's overexpression so, yeah. basically. So, so that's why. Then in that case, how will histones come into play? The gene is already accessible. No. Only thing uh -huh. that is happening is mm -hmm. that probably the enzyme is making it faster. The transcription is going on faster so that more of hemoglobin is getting yeah. produced. So, so uh, where uh, is the question of. Histones coming in. Yeah, so it's in the, already yeah. accessible. Yes. So in the second video, uh, what we uh, what she was trying no. to explain answer, is answer 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 the question. Yeah, uh, answering that question only. Yeah. So, yeah. In the second uh, video, uh, she is actually actually explaining there. Uh, we expect that there are multiple uh, hemoglobin genes. Okay. And uh, some of them are uh, coiled around in histones, and some of uh, some of them are available to express. So as a result, some amount of uh, hemoglobin is being uh, uh, expressed, but uh, not uh, completely. Means uh, the overexpression is not occurring. Whereas in uh, by addition of uh, means uh, by presence of histone acetyl transfer is uh, all the genes are available. Is what we are trying to means uh, hypothesize about it. We are not sure whether it's uh, that. Uh, there are no, that's yeah. That's we are. Well, that's what we are not sure about. No, no. Uh, also, because we know valproic acid, like we are, we have references that valproic acid is a HDAC inhibitor. So we know valproic acid is acting on HDAC. So HDAC, uh, we know it's a histone D acetylase. Uh, like references from references, we know that H, uh, histone D acetylase would remove the acetyl group. So that's why we are theorizing that it would be like acting on histones. Yeah, because uh, just by adding valproic acid, if uh, the redness can be maintained, so. It, it should be uh, related to that level. Means it should act on histones, and uh, as a result, the gene expression should be altered. Is what we are. Yes. 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 We can say that. Yes. In Daphnia reference, we have no. Yeah. It, we have a Daphnia reference regarding that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have references where it says that Daphnia has four uh, four genes of hemoglobin. So with that, we started with Moina doing the same. Uh, it shows the similar four genes that Yeah. Yeah, so uh, they say in the normal conditions where they're not uh, exposed to the hypoxic conditions, uh, only two of them are getting expressed. And in hypoxic conditions, all four of the genes are getting expressed. So that's part of the answer to her question. Yeah. So there are ref references for four, but we have found more references for four rather than six and eight. So uh, just to comment, because we are also trying to ha uh, clone the hemoglobin genes, and we have also been able to See, I think PCR at least one and four. The two and three we have not focused on, but we are trying to amplify it one, one and four because one and four are involved in hypoxia and non normoxia. The difference lies in there. 
I don't remember. Do you remember? Uh, I have. I don't know. The I think, as she said, one and two are uh, expressed yeah, under normoxic and conditions, are, yeah. and four, I think, is specific for hypoxic conditions. I, I might be wrong, but that's possible. I would like to know about the study that you are doing uh, regarding the Parkinson's disease. So uh, how did you exactly do it? Uh, actually, we have just theorized it. Uh, we, I have, like, we haven't started doing it. They have done it in, uh, they have done the phototaxic assay. So what the plan was, uh, we'll study uh, the uh, phototacticity of Moinas. And uh, there were like uh, two links. E e uh, either we'll get a, like, we'll run the phototactic assay and get a moina that would have a motor impairment. Uh, How would you know that a moina has a motor impo uh, impairment? Yeah, so we were thinking about uh, like um, making a setup in which uh, the distance would be uh, marked and uh, at particular amounts of time, how much uh, distance the moina has covered would be measured. So. Like uh, 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 you system. know the nature of how Moina moves, uh, yeah. or even so. Uh, moves. What why we did phototacticity was because we were using valproic acid, and valproic acid we knew was was being used as a treatment for epilepsy. So we thought probably valproic acid would have some other effect on the neural system of the mo of the organism. So we did phototact phototactic acids based on that. So what we found out was we took controls where uh, where the normal uh, the where the Moinas kept in normal environment were taken and the others were kept in valproic acid at 4 microgram per ml. And we tracked their, their movement and we compared their uh, the graphs of the movements and we found no distinct effect. We, we At least that concentration at 4 microgram per ml, there were no distinct uh, you know differences in their movement. That's why I'm asking, uh, do you know the standard uh, or in the common No, no actually they, they have a tracker software uh, which would, uh, you know, uh, you can manually uh, track them at, like point them at uh, each point uh, where the direction changes just like vectors, and then the software itself will calculate how much distance is traveled. You only have to steadily hold the test tube and then upload the video into the software and then mark it. Uh, it will tell the distance and the time taken. So how many individuals do you take? I mean, how many? No, we are not saying it's Parkinson's. Um, see, w we. No, 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 uh, no, yeah. See, they are doing it, they are doing uh, VP. Are you any graph or design of? We haven't started working on Parkinson's. What happened was uh, there was a major group. Have you any idea how they can move a particular Yeah, it's in jerky motion. The Moina moves in jerky motion. Like, uh, it's, not, it's not linear. It doesn't move in a like steady way. No, we are. Uh, uh, I am assuming that it would like uh, uh, move move away from the light. Like uh, they have no, away, away from the light, or it won't light. it won't show phototacticity. What? Move away or towards that's another matter, not related to Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Uh, you are saying as in it would be sensory, and uh, Parkinson it has to be motor. Parkinson's for motor motor coordination. Motor coordination, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Probably because uh, in the phototactic assays, what we are doing is uh, we are taking a, a time of 10 seconds, 10 to 11 seconds, and in that we are seeing if that organism can reach the yeah, uh, the source of light. So probably in Parkinson's, it won't be able to reach the source of light in that particular time interval. Yeah, thank you. It's still a theory. Uh, we I uh, like they, we haven't yet started yeah, working we haven't on it. Started These started are the theories which we can say, but this phototactic acid which we did was not based on Parkinson's. It was just uh, uh, just to take check the behavioral change. Because they have been working using VPA for um, uh, this. Um, As an uh, HDAC inhibitor. HDAC inhibitor. For epigenetical studies, they have been using VPA. So they thought v uh, using VPA might cause another trouble in Moina. So they thought, OK, we'll run a phototactic assay based on that. So that's how the that, that was done. But the Parkinson's one hasn't, the assay hasn't been performed yet. Yeah, what? Yeah, actually kind of uh, social organism, not exactly social, 
but yeah. they are aggregated. So whenever there are some individuals moving in a particular direction, the other individual will move uh, accordingly. Yeah. So that's why you, you see the photo taxis. But when you take a single individual. We take a single individual. They did take a video yeah. which That's what see? I'm trying to say. Yeah. When you take a single individual, there is uh, not another visual signal for a um, individual, for an individual Moina to follow uh, or to move away or towards the light. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying that probably uh, the movement of a single individual in such a lighted path, because you uh, somehow light it from above, but there is light all around too. Uh, actually, that was their photo tactic essay. Uh, I've been planning something else. Um, that was the major goofer because I didn't discuss this in group. So I was planning on my own. I've been like um, uh, uh, brainstorming. I made a setup using like uh, connected two test tubes. And uh, the middle point, I made a hole so that I can add uh, the moinas from the middle portion. And the distance was marked from that middle portion towards like right and left. And one arm would be covered with a black paper. And the another arm, light would be supplied at the end of the other arm uh, perpendicularly. So I thought of something like that, uh, but I didn't discuss like in the group. So I didn't know they were performing a photodactic essay. If you cover it with a black cover, how yeah. will you uh, track the movement? No, uh, yeah, so th in that case, I won't be able to track the movement. I'm still thinking, how would I do that? Because I'll only get the, uh, like, uh, I'll mark, I was thinking I'll mark the test tubes uh, with a distance. And uh, after a certain time, I'll see how much they have gone. Because if they, like, uh, still there's a problem that if they back tra like travel back, I won't be able to understand if they have, like, so that's a problem I'm still thinking about. So, so in the photo taxis assay which you see right here in this, so it's it's a one with light and one without light. So in the one without light, the moina is it's remaining at the bottom of the test tube. It's not going anywhere. And in the one in which the light is being provided, it's actually traveling traveling towards the source of light. So that shows probably it's photo tactic. In case you you guys have any here. comments on how to like make the photo tactic essay, please do comment. I'm still stuck. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the, so I actually, I think it's positively phototactic as well uh, mm -hmm. from your assay and quantitative assay shows that as well. And uh, I think that itself sort of explains that uh, if a single Moena can do it, do we know then in a group they are all doing the same thing or then are we invoking that they are following a leader? Exactly. We don't know that, right? There's no way to invoke that the Moena are following a leader. Right? So it's possible that all of them are doing the same thing because a single Moina is doing it. So that's, again, Occam's razor. Apply Occam's razor to your experiments. All right. Um, uh, we are, your valproic acid experiment, how did you decide for micromolar? Um, it was just experimental. We just started off. We, uh, we, made a, we, made, we took a 200 mg tablet, and we just diluted it. We reached till 4, so we used the 4 microgram. So right now, uh, uh, we're just trying to make different concentrations and use it. So it's still on process. So uh, maybe a good way to start with this experiment is also to look at literature. What have people used for valproic acid concentrations? Yeah, yeah, right? sure, we do. Because are you in the concentration range that is effective or not? What is the point of doing an experiment where you may not expect something to happen, right? Yeah, sure. Because every inhibitor will work on a particular concentration range. Yeah, it's not so, true um, that you just add an inhibitor and it will yeah, so we have uh, we have data with four microgram per ml remaining red, but then we tried it with eight and twelve also. We found that in one setup it re didn't remain red. It so went back when you to say colorless. it remains red, that's the other part. I'm not clear about the experimental details. Yeah, did you say it remains red in spite of you not providing any more milk, or what is the experimental setup? It's the it's the same setup uh, which we are using for the normal conditions. So uh, we, are, we are adding two drops to the normal condition one, and the hypoxic one, we are adding six drops. So uh, it's remaining red even when we are providing it with only two drops of milk. So that it's, that's in the normal condition. Normal, yeah, normal okay. oxygen concentration. All right. Yeah. Uh, also, like, what do you mean by red? Because red, uh, uh, how do you estimate like it is uh, actually producing? See, even if it is colorless, it doesn't mean that it is not producing hemoglobin because you may not be able to see as red. So, so we have, how do you uh, say we have controls. Like uh, what we do is we have one for the normal one, one for the hypoxic one, and the other one is for the test one in which we are adding valproic acid. And then we are comparing all the three colors. So in that, we. But I think his comment yeah. is that you should have a separate. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so redness. Uh, so redness. Uh, for that, we are planning to uh, actually try to estimate the hemoglobin content. So that would be directly uh, means eliminating any ideas of the redness. Yeah. So. Uh, 
Yeah, but the problem is, yeah, the image is uh, also uh, challengeable because the intensity of the microscope of what we are taking yeah, the pictures, yeah. yeah. So at a pre pre uh, preliminary level, we can do it. Right, right. We uh, thought of uh, uh, using that uh, cyanomethemoglobin method, spectrophotometer using. So we are still working on it, uh, making the protocol uh, and everything, setting up the protocol. And then we'll perform by the next. Uh, so we are planning uh, his question, uh, how do you know it's red? So we are planning on doing a cyanomethemoglobin met uh, method test. It's a spectrophotometer test where uh, estimation of hemoglobin can be done. And uh, the regions are specifically, uh, specifically reacts with hemoglobin theme group. So we are planning to do that. So we haven't done it yet, but we are planning to do that. So uh, though these tests are usually done with few mLs of blood. Yeah. So that was the problem we faced right. because we don't have that much mL of uh, blood. Right. So you that. will never achieve that. Yeah. Uh, my question is, therefore, they should look for a technique that will be viable for your model system. Yeah. Right? So okay. maybe um, this is something that I had helped some. Uh, is uh, Arunan? There was this one time where. I huh? Uh, for the using lanistic. Yeah, yeah. I had helped. I some yeah. so there was one method that some of the cubists were trying that they would crush the moina or centrifuge the moina and then look at the supernatant that they can get and look, uh, look directly estimated under a nano spectrophotometer okay. so using a nano drop now it, at cbs I, we have a nano drop so you're welcome to come and i can help you sort of check that thank you sir okay okay so we'll take a last couple of questions, if there are any, uh, because we. Okay, no questions. No. So, uh, in conclusion. Uh, so, could you also comment on the connections that you would draw? Huh. Uh, we actually didn't uh, get the time to uh, draw the concept, map, <laughs> actually. Yeah, but. Yeah. So, we. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask, what is acting as an HDAC inhibitor when you are keeping the moinas in a uh, hypoxic condition? Uh, naturally, HDAC... Uh, as the? Uh, in, the norm, in the hypoxic condition. So you added valproic acid, and you kept the moinas in normal condition. Yeah. Your moinas turned red, yeah, or it yeah. remained in the red yeah, condition. Yeah. In the red. OK, now you are putting the moinas, other moinas, mm -hmm. in a hypoxic condition. It's turning red. You are not adding valproic acid here. There has to be some molecule which is acting uh, as a So we uh, have histone acetyl transferases, which are already present. So they turn, they help it turning red. So there's no other, the histone deacetylase is not at all working over there. See, there is no HDAC inhibitor there. In normoxia condition, there's another, completely another enzyme called as histone acetyl transferase. Yeah. Norm normoxia condition, this molecule is there. Like in normal ox uh, hypoxia condition, this molecule is there, uh, estrogen acetyl transferase. So what it does is transfers uh, acetyl group, and the gene um, becomes available for transcription. While uh, what we are doing is we are providing a ex like uh, um, uh, artificial setup. We are providing HDAC inhibitor and keeping the gene, like we are assuming it keeps the gene open. It doesn't like, it's not like hypoxia. Have you understood? <laughs> no. I, in the normal conditions, then the colorless moinas are kept into the red, into the hypoxic condition. So histone acetyl transferases come, and they they come into play, and because of that, the gene becomes accessible. When these are kept back into the normal conditions, the red ones, histone deacetyl uh, deacetylases come into play, and then they remove the acetyl group. Thereby, the gene is again inaccessible to the RNA polymerase. Now, what we are doing is, in the normal conditions, when these red moinas are put, they have to turn back to colorless. But now we are adding the inhibitor for histone deacetylase. So because of that, histone deacetylase is not working, and it's t the organism is still remaining red. See, I have a problem here. Like, uh, I have this problem from a very long time now. Yeah, okay. You guys forget that it's in hypothesis. You cannot explain it in such a manner yeah, that it's, it's there. You cannot tell it. Yeah. That's the problem with the thing that you always end up around HAT, HADEAC. Keep reading about it. You yeah. don't know. Even Sir mentioned that uh, H uh, the acetylation, histone acetylation, and transcription are very uh, sim I mean, you cannot distinguish uh, on the basis of qualitative analysis that you're doing. Keep 
reminding yourself that it's an hypothesis. Yeah. Whenever you start, keep saying that it's hypothesis. You do that not know anything except that probably there is an inhibitor that helps us to retain its color. You don't know whether actually HDAC is involved at all or not. Okay. You're yeah. saying that uh, in other experiment too, you are saying that uh, uh, valproic acid, it, uh, it creates epilepsy. I mean, it, uh, it, it's it some, not some part. Valproic is, acid is, it's, it's being used as a treatment for epilepsy. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm telling. So, so yeah. that means they, uh, it has some uh, regions in the genome that it's going and uh, probably interacting with. You don't know what is the reason that it's retaining the color. So whenever you explain something, start with it's an hypothesis. It's an okay? hypothesis, yeah. Thank so you. You can also look for, you know, like whether, uh, so how do you find out? Question yeah. is also, no, you don't know. But how do you find out is HDAC? For example, how do you check whether it actually is HDAC present or not? That those are also questions which should do. Okay, um, hello. So I'm skeptical about this whole essay in a manner that you are subjecting Moinas to, a, they are already in a solution. You're adding something from outside which are like molecules and you're expecting them to reach inside the cell of the moina, then reach inside the nucleus, then go on to those gene loci and act there as, um, as epigenetic markers. So how sure you are that if, it's, a, it's an organism, it's not a cell culture where we expect that, you know, so cells can take things from outside because they're individual cells. We do it in cells. Otherwise, for in organisms, we have to make transgenics or we have to mutate or overexpress genes to do the same kind of thing which you are saying that if you add Suppose anything, suppose something which deacetylates, deacetylates the genome. How sure you are it's reaching the genome and the DNA which is there compact inside the nucleus, which is inside the cell, which is inside the layers of, you know, because Moina is a crustacean, it's a evolved species as compared to bacteria or other single cell organisms or yeast, for example. Hmm? Like how, how can you say that some adding something to the solution is actually affecting the genome? So epigenetics is all about environment. So it is kept in that environment where Epigenetics all is all about sir, the micro-environment of the DNA. Yes, sir. It's not about the, like, the physical environment. If, no, I'm in a, if, I'm, if I'm in heat, know, yes. if I'm in heat, heat is not directly affecting the acetylation and deacetylation marks in my DNA. But your but body would, of course, respond to such situations, right? Yes, my body will so respond because there are molecules from within the body which respond to heat, they are synthesized or made or they are there, they the go and act. The See, same that's, way why she, that's why she said it's an hypothesis and I started with, we are assuming. We don't know for sure, but we are experimenting. Yeah, you have drugs and it works on your body. Well, if all the factors are intrinsic, you said everything is from inside, then what are our skin receptors doing? And skin is said to be, it is hypothesized, according to Kajal, uh, uh, the second brain. Like it is, each and every cell is respond responding. Then what is the role of skin receptors? What is the role of extrinsic and intrinsic protein in the cell membrane? Everything is internal, then what is the phenotypic effect of the environment on our behavior? Ex External factors can environment ka role kyun hai fir? What is the role? Please explain. So exactly, uh, so I am with you only. So I'm saying that if, if something is on contact of the skin, the outer multiple layers of skin is dead. It's not like anything which is in direct contact with skin is changing the genome of the skin itself, no. It's actually, so there are axonal endings which actually respond to the, because it penetrates. It penetrates. That is what I'm asking. If, if, if I'm in a glass shield, UV light cannot do anything to me. Right? But my question is how sure they are that if they are putting something in a solution, Moena is a living organism. It's not like anything can just penetrate inside the cell without, you know, cell regulating it. So how, how sure is it? it because it goes inside the body, because it's metabolized. So how sure they are that it, it is no, going is inside? Is your question uh, like uh, how sure we are that uh, it is going, it is the one, HDAC inhibitor is the one which is making it red? Yes, is your question actually, like that? yes, yes. So if the HDAC is synthesized from within the cell, I know that it's, it's already inside the cell. See, that's why we have controls. We are running replicates. Uh, and we know when we are providing HDAC inhibitor, it is remaining red, while the other one, which is not provided with HDAC inhibitor and is in the normal oxygen concentration, it is turning from red to colorless, while our, uh, the ones which we supply with an HDAC inhibitor is not turning colorless, while it should. 
so that's that's so why we, we have replicates. controls for the same we have replicates as well as controls for the for the experiment yeah. So that also uh, lets us understand that they are also uh, giving a thought to the experimental design, right? So that is so crucial. Something these things uh, normally do not happen in our regular practicals, but then this is something that is really happening in these kind of activities, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Aparva, could you just uh, for two within two minutes uh, uh, comment on the con connections that yeah, yeah, could be made yeah. and uh, so. Uh, Basically, uh, our um, um, like there's a lot of topics involved in our ah. syllabus. So uh, this, in this, we can like uh, by cultivating moina, we are like we are saying it turns red and everything. Oxygen, we we are saying it uh, the oxygen concentration decreases, increases and everything. So this can be like uh, the we have a experiment in our uh, syllabus called as Brinkler's method, BOD and COD. So this can be used for uh, uh, actually proving that uh, our and Jay has done that. Uh, so it can be used to. No, <laughs> uh, it can be used to prove that okay, uh, oxygen is really decreasing within five or uh, whatever uh, amount of days we are seeing. And there's another uh, property is that uh, in environmental biology, in study of environmental biology, uh, moinas can be used as the as uh, Sir had said, uh, why moinas are like an ideal uh, model organism. So in environmental biology also they can be used. Uh, there is an experiment called as LD50. Uh, a lot of uh, you guys will be familiar with this, where, uh, with it, where is, wherein uh, the lethal dose or lethal concentration is de uh, of a chemical is determined. So uh, here in India, we have a lot like uh, pollution is increasing. So uh, the the chemical the chemical uh, to be tested uh, in LD50, we can use uh, the river water, like polluted water, uh, water samples. We can use it to test how much like uh, the lethal dose of effluents are uh, being released. And such things, and also in uh, in uh, like uh, Parkinson's assay, we are uh, in phototaxic assays for studying Parkinson's. We are running uh, like we can run blast. Uh, it's a, it's in our syllabus to uh, and also to see the hemoglobin uh, gene sequencing. We can run blast, and uh, there is we have we can study transcription. There is that is in a uh, syllabus transcription gene regulation and biostatistics microscopy. Routine studies, microscope, protein studies. Sorry, protein studies. Uh, yeah, protein studies. Um, uh, like I structure and everything. And then we had this question uh, because cube costly goes on. We had this question: What is milk's composition? Why is your moina like? Why are you adding milk? Uh, so that biochemistry is also like, um, yeah, explored in that. And uh, there's also, uh, we have to like uh, find applications for why we are doing this. So there are different uh, diseases like sickle cell anemia, cancer, as Sir said. Uh, we can also like, that's also there in our syllabus. So neurochemistry, yeah, Parkinson's, we are, and yeah, phototaxic assay. So basically, uh, the very fact that we are making a setup uh, takes a lot. And also, uh, personality development, discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Discipline, regularity, uh, like punct punctuality, <laughs> all those things are also. <laughs> yeah, it is important. We were actually going to add that on in our presentation to make it funny, but we didn't get time to actually make it. So I thought, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, so uh, just uh, uh, we we really would like to thank Arunan sir and also uh, Miss all this project idea. Uh, was really interesting. We enjoyed a lot in these two days in making, and also uh, we learned how to collaborate, how to talk, how to come up with ideas. Because uh, group members are coming with different ideas, so how uh, which idea to follow or something like that. And uh, also we uh, we understood that uh, we been, uh, we needed to make three videos, so we need to distribute the work. So even management, like uh, one group will make this uh, mo uh, topic and another. So even that was something interesting to learn. So we really enjoyed, and we also uh, got to meet uh, uh, earlier uh, workers who, who are working on uh, Moina. So that's also interesting. And uh, also I want to t add is uh, the uh, member from uh, Ranchi, uh, yeah, uh, Rachel, she has actually uh, found uh, another Moina Miss Moina Macrura, according means uh, in her pictures, there are some characteristics she found like uh, that resemble Moina Macrura. So I would like to uh, even get uh, that's uh, that genome sequence. 
Uh, and then, then, yeah. So we, we will actually find another species uh, from Ranchi, yeah. So with the uh, story of micro, Moina Microra, uh, I would like to tell about Cube Branchi also. Like, it's a short story. So while I joined, uh, like how I joined Cube, last year there was a science day uh, in my college where Benita the introduced us with, introduced Cube. So it was quite interesting and it was that how, how she, explained that it was simple to sound. It, it was, it, it sounds simple. So we joined Cube and we found that this is, there is, uh, in this Cube, there is people from throughout the India, uh, they, are, they can help us. So, so in earlier, uh, in early, sorry, <laughs> uh, in earlier, uh, there is there was no lab in our college, so Ganesha from zoology and B uh, Shalini ma'am from microbiology they helped us to proceed our experiment. Like Benita, the Vaishnavi, and uh, Ravindra Bhaiya was there in Cube. So when I when I joined, uh, there was lab, uh, it, which is in our college. So there is also a kitchen lab, uh, kitchen lab of Benita and she maintained all organisms. So how I found Moena, uh, there is a place, the Jharkhand fisheries. So I brought plankton samples from there. And I, when I observed it under microscope, I found that this is, this is more like Moena. So I cultured them. And what I did with them, that uh, there is already known that Moena reproduce after three to four days. So I calculated that, yes. Uh, yes, my moena reproduced after three days. Like I observed it. So because of some reason, I lost it. But I again cultured. I again brought plankton samples, and I cultured them, uh, which look, that, I, that I earlier said that that was more similar like Daphnia. But when I observed and that Kajal sent that link, and I see that that was that belonged to Daphne family that was not exactly Daphnia. But while culturing them, I found brown hydras. Like, while I was culturing them, I found that in my cup, I was culturing cups, so there was no moina. Uh, sorry, there was no flea. So when I posted that, uh, in that cup, I found something like hydra. So when I posted, Arunansa said that, yeah, uh, this can be Hydra uh, because Hydra eats fleas. So when I Googled it, that, and I got sure that th that was Hydra. So th there is some photos and videos. So I can share later in group. OK, so we'll now proceed to the uh, next present, because there are some uh, people who want to leave early. They have trains and all. So I'll just call uh, Komal Singh from Bilaspur, who has a presentation on nail regeneration. So he has to just. Uh, good afternoon, Arunan sir and uh, Nagarjun sir. I'm thankful to inviting me in this uh, conference of Cube Workshop. Uh, myself, Dr. Kumal Singh Suman uh, from Central University, Blaspur. Today I'm going to present uh, topic of nail, nail regeneration. Uh, that's uh, very little data, but uh, interested. Mm, this one? Yeah. This. So, so process of uh, regeneration that's a renewal or rest uh, restoration or growth that makes genome yeah 
I'm, I'm Dr. Komal Singh Suman from Guru Ghasida Central University. Uh, there I'm an assistant professor. I'm uh, also uh, coordinating a cube lab there. And uh, students are very interesting to work in this cube group. And they are doing. And uh, they are uh, maintaining many cube models, like uh, uh, fruit flies that I carried, and uh, other uh, earthworm, Jebra phase for regeneration, and uh, uh, also working on uh, mosquito for that they awarded for by the Chhattisgarh Council of Science, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, this student. So today I'm uh, going to present here the model system for regeneration. That's a nail bed regeneration. So regeneration that's a process of renewal or restoration and growth that makes genome cell okay that makes cell or uh, whole entire organism or ecosystem so we all know the every species have capacity of regeneration and uh, we very uh, we know very well that uh, our liver have too much potential uh, too much potency to regenerate if cut out half of the portion but uh, we can't work, it's our, uh, uh, these students, uh, graduate students can't work on stem cell or inside the in vivo culture. So there is an alternative that's a good alternative to work if they want to work on regeneration. That's a, uh, that's a process of regeneration. That's a process by the extrusion, extrusion in which cell uh, propagate and uh, form another cell that expel the uh, old cell that come out from in the form of nail. So here, uh, pointer. <coughs> the the white, white uh, half moon shape that cell uh, lunula, that uh, measurement is necessary for uh, growth of uh, nail. <coughs> That's a lunula, that's a, uh, essential for the measurement. How much that's growing and what is the growth rate? Uh, that may be differ on the basis of gender, on the basis of another uh, aspect or variable. That may differ. So our observations is uh, we observe the nail regeneration after election, after Vidhan Sabha election. So there is a marker on nail. They put a mark on nail. So uh, we interested uh, because Arunan sir told me that's a nail, nail regeneration also a model. So I'm also interested. Then I found a person, I, because I'm not from the Chhattisgarh, so I have no marker on that time <laughs> because I was busy in classes. So I couldn't uh, appear in our elections in MP. So I found a person that's Ajay, that's a male. Uh, and I observed the nail of that person after 16 days. The, I have images. And uh, after then, I also another found a girl that's a Sivani, that's a female. And uh, again, Ajay, after one month. And I observed and I. Uh, compile the image in this uh, presentation after so observation after 16 days after one month and after two months so these are our observations so this is the observation of Ajay after 16 days in which uh, we observe this nail on a graph paper so graph paper have Blocks, little little blocks. That's a millimeter blocks or centimeter. This is one block. That's a uh, one one centimeter block. This is one centimeter, and each one centimeter block have ten millimeters block. So these are the measurement, and I observed the Aja nail grown approximate two millimeter within sixteen days, and. Uh, on that time, uh, I didn't find the Sivani that have also marked. And after one month, uh, and uh, at uh, 19 December, election were conducted on 20th November. The, and 19 December, 
I met with uh, Sivani and Ajay, both. So I found, I observed the nail grown. That's uh, Ajay nail grow approximate, approximate four millimeter, approximate four millimeter, four millimeter, but uh, Sivani nail grow only three millimeter. So gender wise, it, it differs, and uh, gender wise, different growing property of nails. And uh, this is uh, another data. This is uh, 16 days, and uh, this is one month data, and uh, this is the uh, two month dat data that provided by the Sivani. I uh, observed after two weeks, I observed the nail grown till six or 6.5 millimeter. So uh, today, uh, uh, recently I didn't uh, get the data from uh, she somewhere, so she couldn't provide me. So uh, although that may be, or uh, maybe that may be uh, grown till uh, nine, uh, nine millimeter. So it would be a good model for regeneration study, stem cell uh, study. Yes, any question? Any questions? Sir, normally the body heals. Yeah. And uh, the rate, what you claim to be uh, regeneration, mm. this is the normal healing or the growth process where the keratin plays a role. And the entire body is uh, like, you know, the dust which is given out. I'm just sharing my part of information. Mm. That is uh, the process of keratosis, the keratin protein which adds to the nails. Aap, uh, jisko regeneration care, kya wo normal growth nahi hai, which takes place in our body. That means, uh, have you amputated that nail? Was it cut off? No. My first question. No, no. Without cutting, this is a normal growth process, sir, which occurs in our body. Yeah, so how is growth but, but and regeneration the same? Cell are growing. It, this is the, so model, mo this is the model for stem cell research because there are uh, cells have potential to grow. So how? You are just explaining nail growth as regeneration. Regeneration is when there is amputation. You have to remove that part. Then it will regenerate. Like, let's take yeah, an yeah, invertebrate example. We, we you cut off the planaria's body into many parts and it regenerates the rest of the parts. Like in earthworm, it regenerates the part which is amputated. It is yeah. cut off. B but nail is also a part of body that we cut? Sir, the dead part we are cutting, not the living part. So please explain this part. I just wanted the clarification. Uh, actually, what happens is, you know, when the nail grows, it, it, it grows from the bed. So, the you know, I can just show it here also. Here, actually, the nail is supposed like this. No, sir, that is growth. You, that is not regeneration. Are, yeah, yeah, you are saying regeneration that's a dead is. Part. That's a dead part. We are no, the nail part. is growing on the living part. Like Only the part which we cut off, sir, that is a dead part. So, regeneration and growth are two this, different this, things. But this is the living part. This is, this the, is, living part. Yeah, this is the entire living part. The pink portion is totally living. Yeah. See, that means the whole body is regenerating, and we are multicellular organism. Our skin also regenerates, correct? Our skin regenerates. So, so our skin nail is a part of the skin. No, no, no. Uh, ah. uh, skin regenerates means what? Skin doesn't grow. Skin when we are, see growth means it is already you know it is growing. But when you cut it, for example, or some cells are you know dying off, and other cells are repla replacing those cells. That is actually the part so of the. So this is the process in the in the entire body. That old no, cells no. are worn out. Every day RBC is removed. 
and yeah. new cells are added. That means they are also regenerating. That means normal growth and removal of old cells and adding new cells are regeneration in the body. But uh, regeneration is removing. Can you please explain what I'm asking? Yeah. I think he has understood what. So I think it's a very common, uh, it's a co very common problem among students, especially 9, 10th, and even f some 11, 12 students, that how you should differentiate whether a body process is regeneration or growth. So the growth is a constant stage of division of cells, like where the cells are constantly proliferating doing my thought. But the, the, the difference between growth and regeneration is regeneration comes at the at, at the time of need. So the cells are already in a differentiated forms. They are not, they are not dividing further. further. They are at stop. But when time comes, like when you, suppose you cut an annelid or an earthworm or a planaria from half, now there is a need for the cells to divide. So those cells which were stagnant, which were sitting there, were not dividing, now start dividing. Yeah. Regeneration. What is the cell which is uh, playing an important role in it? Have you uh, heard of totipotency? Yeah. So what, what are the totipotent cells in the nail bed? Are there totipotent no, cells no, in the no, nail bed? Not totipotent. They are, not are multipotent. Yeah, pluri, yeah, multipotent. They are multipotent. They are multipotent. Yeah. And still they are regenerating. Yeah. I just quickly did a uh, search. There is a nature paper of uh, 2013. It's a News and Views article, how nails regenerate lost fingertips. So I mean, fingertip is lost. The nail bed regenerates the lost fingertips. So you can see that it's a nature paper, 12th June 2013. Actually, there's a paper, but this is a News and Views article. So it's easy to understand. 2013, 12th June. So apparently it looks like, so uh, it looks like nail bed has got a lot of what you are asking about stem cells uh, tucked in, which uh, which will be also involved in nail, re nail growth or regeneration. Here follicle. So Hina can check this and read it. Yeah, nail bed. Yes. So, uh, okay, next we will uh, call another group, uh, which is snail group. Snail actually is talking, uh, is, will be discussing about uh, something which is another frontier area, which is a... In 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh, we, uh, so Snail group will be discussing about uh, learning and memory, uh, which is a behavioral plasticity studies. So please come. Yeah.
सर ये वायर निकला है कौन सा सर ये वायर Starting button cuts. Starting button cuts. Starting. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, आवाज़ इतने बजते हैं, बाबू? So good afternoon, everyone. We are from Elphiston College. My name is Shubham. She is Jagruti, Anita, and Nandini. I am Toshika from CHM College, Ulas Nagar, and this is Apurva from CHM College. I am Afrin from Bhavan's College. I am I am Mansi from uh, Ismail Yusuf. So here we are working on a snail. How do snail learn? So we'll watch the video. maintain a basket culture. Firstly, take a plastic tray. Add a water in it so as to create a moist environment around it. Put a basket in tray. Then keep a snail in basket. What are these humans doing with us? Why I am here? These humans are trying to study and understand. How do we learn? What is learning? Learning is a result of an event or stimulus which brings a change in behavior in us which may be temporary or permanent. Oh, what they did with you? They performed olfactory assay on me. What is olfactory assay? Olfaction is the action or a capacity of a smelling the sense of a smell. The olfactory assay is a test used to measure the olfactory ability. Wait, let me show you. My baby is so hungry. Let's see where it goes. It went towards the coriander because it was hungry and it smells the coriander. Oh, okay. Dammy, what is this too, Andy? We have two pairs of tentacles. The big one is called as superior tentacles and the smaller are called as the inferior tentacles. The eyes are present on the tip of the superior tentacles and we sense the smell by inferior tentacles. I see. Oh, 
I, yeah, that's, that's what you know. <laughs> so you want to say something on the video? Mm, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yeah, good ha, ha. Yeah. Yes. Oh, just, just a minute, just a minute. But the, the uh, snail went away from uh, the coriander. Yeah, but it went towards the coriander side, right? Yeah, then, they, then it smelt and it ran away. No, mm. actually, at the time, we don't have an exact video, but uh, when, we, when we did that assay, we had a... Uh, exact uh, uh, video that snail is going towards coriander and he uh, he ate that. Oh, okay. Okay, so now I we don't have that. So video. this is a goof up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is made up. The eyes are present on the tips and nipples, and we sense the smell by inferior tentacles. Oh, I see. So what concentration of garlic is poisonous or it's like? She will explain everything because the goof up was happened with her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so now you are under the bus thrown yes. by your colleagues. Yeah, so the question is same. So how did you figure out that garlic is poisonous? Like, did you sacrifice your snails for that or? Actually, we don't know. <laughs> that it was poisonous, uh, uh, garlic was poisonous for smell. Uh, suddenly, uh, that idea came in my mind that why can't we try with snail? Um, I didn't search on Google or anything. Uh, I just uh, go for it. Uh, um, the, the mistake was I made that I should f first confirm that what is good for snail and what is bad for snail. But, um, not knowing uh, that, I, I already started with doing garlic experiment on them. But like that was good or bad is subjective. Like how can you know what is good for snail? I am aversive to a lot of things. Like I'm aversive to karela, but karela is not a poison to me, yes. right? Now the point is, if you if you state on a slide that garlic is poison for snails, that statement is a very robust statement. That should actually come from some literature evidence or from some essay which you know depicts that this. Yeah. There is a research paper there that says that uh, garlic uh, kills snail. But we don't know that. Uh, without knowing that, we already uh, done a garlic experiment or said that's mistake I've made. So what did you find when you used the garlic extract? Did the snail die? He's asking that. No, the snail uh, don't, don't die. Actually, what happens? Um, uh, snail was attracted towards uh, that garlic. Um, as soon as uh, snail uh, eats that, um, uh, nah, taste that uh, garlic, yeah, it suddenly um, the, uh, goes inside the shell and the religious smile, uh, slime. slime, sorry. Slime. <laughs> 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 That's some mucus. Um, but after um, we done a certain experiment repeatedly, we found that uh, it was attracted towards uh, garlic and um, it was uh, it um, attracted towards garlic and uh, sometimes uh, it uh, tastes the garlic also. So isn't it counterintuitive for a snail? Because it knows that garlic is not good for me and still getting attracted towards it. Yes, like we are trying to go further with that. It, it is really uh, good that we use garlic. Yeah. yeah. And then the next logical question that Raoul was also asking is like, what is important? What is important is that uh, at what concentration would it feel, you know, would, would not want to go towards the garlic? Right? Because uh, something that worked for you, where the snail is going towards the garlic, what was the concentration of garlic when you read that research paper? What was the concentration that they had used? Crushed, crushed, right. 
Uh, it was a paste. paste. Yes. Yeah. Because the experiences could be different at different concentrations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very easy with garlics now. Garlics comes like tablets. So one garlic in 30 ml of water, two garlics in 30 ml of water, three garlic seeds in 30 ml of water. Right. This you can do, right? I didn't st standardize it. Uh, I just I'm added uh, one drop of uh, garlic on one side, and on the other side, I add distilled water. Uh, but that one drop of garlic. But yeah. what he's saying is that one drop of garlic you make from a standardized extract. So instead of just going one garlic, two garlic, you can even weigh the garlic, right? Okay. So that we know that one gram of garlic in one ml of water, or two grams of garlic in two ml of water, like that. You know, and you then you take a drop from there, hmm. you do this. So you standardize. So standardized stuff. concentration is. Maybe you'll figure out that. Maybe you'll figure out that for like sm uh, uh, smaller concentrations, the snail is attractive. It's actually tasting it, but it's not showing so much of aversive behavior. But at higher concentrations. It's not attractive anymore because the smell, odor, and the taste, the pungent smell of garlic will also keep increasing. Um, like maybe it's it's just an intuition. Uh, like actually, uh, the garlic smell was very strong um, in in the whole lab. That that means that concentration is very high. <laughs> yes. But still, still it was getting attracted. You see. Yes. 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 So this banana error is in uh, like. Complement to the garlic extract, or it, it is in the uh, it's a error. <laughs> like, <laughs> that also to you also. <laughs> no, <laughs> she will explain. <laughs> Actually, we were performing in lab, mm -hmm. and Drosophila group also was performing simultaneously. Then uh, uh, we were checking oil factory assay. <laughs> Uh, we were using, con we were doing control test, but uh, banana smell uh, was coming from the Drosophila group. So directly, we were doing whatever we were doing group, so the smell was coming from So it's like that our control test was like wasted. Because of that, we were doing 20 control tests, but the smell was coming from there. So we realized it very soon. How it got uh, spoiled, is it? Control so, test, what happened to the control test? Actually, uh, we were doing control test that no smells in the room. But there were a lot of banana and a lot of fruits ki smell. Thi, but we realized that there were a lot of smells. So how did you realize? You, got, uh, you expected some results and you got some different Haan, results? Yeah, we got results ki, uh, in which side the banana was placed. The snail was moving in that direction only. Um, like we have performed that 20 times, so uh, 15 times it was going towards that direction. Uh, uh, so you for you for the snail test, you kept banana on one side and water on the other side or something? No, we uh, we kept snail only. We didn't put uh, we put distilled water on both the sides. Okay. So what did you expect when you kept uh, distilled water? We expected it would uh, it will move randomly because there is no smell to attract it, but. Uh, it will. Uh, it was moving on the side where banana was placed. Yeah. We are using that. We are, we are using a are fish using tank uh, covered with the black paper so that no smell can come while doing. Uh, yeah. 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 No. Yeah. But we are using that box, uh, fish we tank. Avoiding any other yeah. 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 Like and snail as a favorite member in the group, and he sees the member. And so this is a new thing that you're adding. You didn't do, you didn't use the fish tank for this thing, uh, poisonous garlic experiment and banana error. We used it. We did. We did. So we did how? How did they rule it out? I think the first set of experiment was in open, where you figured out that this was the problem. And then now you are using that chamber. To no, uh, in first uh, mistake, uh, in garlic, uh, we uh, used tank covered with black uh, paper. OK, so but this. <coughs> no, in that also we used. 
So if you use tank and you can smell banana somewhere, it does not mean snail can also sense banana. No? It's already inside a chamber. If the room has any smell, but the snail is in a cham chamber where you are just putting uh, garlic, the chamber should not have, so smell cannot penetrate glass. Yes. In banana, they didn't use the garlic in the first place. So there was banana in the chamber itself. No, no there was, was there banana in the chamber? Where was banana is the question. Banana was in the adjacent room. So it's the same, same room. No, no. Like, in, in, oh. It can contain the smell if they are using anything. Yes. But, but the snails were in chamber. Yes. Same area. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Your, your garlic has poisoned stuff. So what I understand from your description is that uh, they eat, the snail moved towards the garlic side, mm. garlic smell side. Yes. And when it tasted, it went and tasted, and then it moved away. Mm. Or you said that it smiled. <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, okay. Um, it, 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 it uh, secreted uh, slime, is it? Uh, so it could be that it is a good smell for the snail. Garlic is a good, it, it was an attractant for the snail as a smell, but a repellent as a taste. The taste of the uh, garlic was repelling, so it moved away. Mm. It, um, it will be very nice that the same snail repeatedly you allow it to move towards the uh, garlic and the, uh, taste it. After some time, it will, it will not even move towards it. So that means it's a very nice conditioning study you can do it with that. Yes. Yeah, it, it's a good smell, but a bad taste. It yes. realized it. Yes. So, Also, olfaction and gustation goes hand in hand. It's like the first line is olfaction. If you smell something which smells nice to you, then you go to taste it. Yes. Something is smelling, like if, if it's aversive in olfaction only, mainly organisms don't go and taste it, right? So if you say that garlic is a poison, first of all, that you have to, poison. yeah. Poison was is too generic. Like poison in what sense? Is it aversive for the olfaction or the gustation? Yeah. Or it's killing them, yeah. And if it's yeah. killing them, at what concentration it's killing them? It should not be like cyanide, you just touch and die. Yes. Right. So all these things need to be figured out. Okay. And an yes. essay which can distinguish between olfaction and gustation should be done, okay. whether they're linked in case of garlic or not. Okay. Okay. garlic from now. They'll be happy. See, this is the reason we were not eating. Hello. So you said the uh, the snail has good and bad food. So according to you, which are the good food? And according to you, what does the snail likes? Um, according to me, uh, snail likes uh, leafy vegetables, roots, stems, and fruits. So I have a snail. It has stopped eating anything, like not banana, not cucumber, not carrot, anything. So what should I do? So uh, uh, as we go on through some no. reference, <laughs> Uh, we find that uh, there was a suggestion that when the uh, snails are ill or they are in, uh, when snails are ill they, they stop eating anything they stop their movement they don't eat anything and when they got recovered then they start eating no as normal they are going to eat so how to recover and how to know the snail is ill and i am i don't know much about snail and we don't have i guess doctor for snails so how to know the snail is ill and what the problem is with the snail are your snails in soil? No, it is the same snail you guys are experimenting. I am doing okay. the same. But so the snail isn't eating anything. So, so same thing happened with us. So we made soil cup cultures for snails. Okay. So, so they recovered after one month. Sorry, one week. one week. Okay, so I have to make the soil cup yeah. culture. Yes. Okay, thank you. Huh. Yes. No, snail. Our snails are like uh, five yeah. centimeter. Like they are not. This uh, much. They are like baby. No, this baby, baby snails. snails. Baby snails. They are not mature yet. So, any more questions? 
Okay, are there any more questions? Four to they five. shell. Four they five. shell. How many four. worlds? Uh, four. Four to four. five. So what is the normal? Uh, let's say when it is born, how many shells? How many worlds they have? And when when it uh, becomes adult, how many they have? Any and idea? So are you using an adult snail or a juvenile snail? Both. 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 We both. We are using both. It is a it is a actually on a world size like a ma uh, mature snails have seven to eight worlds and uh, as yeah uh, six, to six to seven six to seven and uh, so as we as we are uh, culturing uh, our baby snails our baby snails has three to four uh, worlds three, four. three to four yes four. we have a we have a Three, three baby snails. So in some, uh, two are two are having four, and one is having three worlds. I have a question that uh, uh, while you are doing the olfactory assay, that uh, did you observe that the adult and the juvenile snails, uh, according to your uh, sample or like the food which you are given in the uh, assay, uh, which of the snail uh, reacting faster? Huh, obviously, the mature will uh, react fast rather than baby snail because their uh, their sensory organ are not developed yet. So, as the mature snails having a, a, a like active well sensory, huh, well developed uh, sensory organ, they will react fastly toward the olfaction. What stage it, uh, they are developed? As in? I have another question also. Like, if the adults, they are already more. Uh, exposed to smells that probably the juvenile have not. So probably they won't move because they think, uh, I have already been exposed, I didn't like it. So I didn't, I didn't so go there are two things. First is the, the physiological development of the circuitry, olfactory and gustatory, right? Yeah. So first, first question is, at what stage in, in terms of voles or the days, the, a snail is fully mature for olfaction? Like in Drosophila, we know that for after eight days, drosophilas are fully mature for olfaction. So any olfaction assay on drosophila should not be done on drosophila day six or day seven. It should be done on day 10 or day 11. Mm. Similarly, are, is there literature available for snails where you know that the experiment I'm doing for olfaction, I should first know that now the snail is good enough to you know respond to olfactory cues. So do you know this thing, first um, question? After three months. After three months? Yeah. So after three months, how many what is the size and how many volts are there? After three months, size is around 2.9 and volts are 4 to 5. 2.9 kilometers? No, Slightly centimeter. Slightly. Centimeters. Okay, yeah. two, and your snails are 5 yeah. centimeters. Yeah. Okay, so your snail seems to be mature in terms of olfaction as well as gustation, according to the literature. Hmm. Now the second question is, is there a difference between the uh, response of a, a adult versus a juvenile snail? Both are mature in terms of olfaction, the physiology, but is there a difference in their response? Um, in your essays, have you figured out a difference? Because she said that, yes, there, there would be a difference because mature is, but the, uh, but the circuitry for both is already mature, right? So now, there, is there a difference, first question. And if there is a difference, where is, why is that difference and where is it coming from? Actually, we don't know. We have not compared our results yet. Okay, so when you'll compare a results, first of all, you'll figure out is there a difference. Yes. And if there is a difference, now you know that the circuitry is already developed. So the difference, you cannot blame on circuitry. Now you have to come to Kajal's question, which she asked, that a mature snail has already gone through a lot of, you know, exposures in life hmm. to different, different sm smells, depending on in what conditions they are uh, cultured. So any control experiment, probably one of the factors is naivety. So if you have not been exposed to a, a particular condition, then only your response is uh, comparable when you're comparing uh, adults versus juvenile. But if the adult has already been exposed to condition that juvenile has not been, the comparison is not only on the basis of age. So probably that's a thing so that you can So before performing an essay, we starve snails for 12 hours. Huh. So because of that, uh, smell, uh, snails smells the f uh, sample and they m crawl, to crawl towards that direction. Snails are compelling the snails because they are hungry. They hmm. actually, if you give anything, if you'll give anything f 
to them, which hmm. they can smell and they feel that it's good, they will go towards it. Because a fully fed snail may not go and you say that it's not attracted towards that cue, which is a false uh, positive result. So you are ov like overriding that fact, it's good. But what she's asking is, a, a mature snail and a juvenile sm snail, both matured in circuitry, do they have differences in responses now? Because it is now coming from something external. Are you getting what I'm, what she's asking to you, right? Mm. So is it, like, can you find this thing that a mature snail is responding less compared to a juvenile snail? Both developed, Both developed in their circuitries, but because of exposure extent which they got in their lifetime. The difference is because of that. Is it? I think to add, add one more thing to the same understanding is the, just to use a different word here, memory of the mm -hmm. smell, right? right? Yeah. Essentially, they're asking if there, if there is a memory of the smell, how is it going to affect the response? Um, actually, actually, I have an example. We performed an experiment with snails. So first, we uh, let our snails to eat coriander leaves, which are normal coriander leaves. And in second round, we let our snails to eat coriander leaves, which are dipped in quinine sulfate. So after that, uh, for two days, our snail did not eat anything. So from this, we concluded that uh, they have developed a memory towards our normal coriander leaves. Is it? Uh, uh, they, uh, we even gave them tomato. They did not even eat tomato. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we do. Uh, actually, we done the same experiment with cucumber, and we found the uh, same only. Okay. Mm. Uh, no, they were not sick. We are, we are trying to say that they have developed a memory towards the normal coriander leaves. Uh, a short-term memory or a long-term memory? A short-term memory. OK, is it a condition reflex? Do you think this is a condition reflex? You created starvation, like you, you starved your uh, model organism. Yes. And uh, it responded to the stimuli. Huh. OK, so is it a condition reflex? Yes. OK, that is the connection to the syllabi, again. That I am connecting to my content, like what I am taking back home. Like snails, we can teach response to stimuli yes. Yes. in class 12th. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. OK, thank you. We, so first we started with six, and then we, uh, later on we are performing 20 runs. 20 runs? Yeah, in starting we performed six runs. Three. Why 20 runs? Is it so, why? No, no, no. The six runs are OK, but are the six runs on the same snail, or there are different six snails? Same snail. Same snail. So the point is, last year also a group did this, so you don't realize that there is, what is the significance of N? N is not like I'm taking Kajal and I'm doing something on her as an experiment and doing it 10 times. But the organism is N equal to 1. You do it 10 times or 20 times, it will replicate what it is doing in the first place. It does not make it N equal to 10. N equal to 10 is 10 different organisms showing the same kind of response. Then you can say, now I have overruled that they are sick. Now I have overruled that they, there's a difference between any other external factor, because you have done on 10 different snails. So that is N, you know? You should take more snails to do this. You can uh, do the experiment on the same snail if you're taking it after, like, time, that we were discussing about the juvenile and adult thing. Yeah, yeah. But in that case, because, yeah, because they are stating that the short-term memory in their case is for two days. So, uh, and on what basis you are deciding it is short-term memory or long-term memory? Because, uh, after two days, they ate normal coriander leaves. Can I say? Uh, actually, we done with different snails. <laughs> no. We, yeah. I take uh, back my question adult, then. Adult difference. With adult snails. Three. 
ऑलमोस्ट यस ऑलमोस्ट बिकॉज ऑफ So before we open our mouth, next time you say, okay, I know what you're going to ask. It's n equal to 20, and 20 different snails are there. So you should, someone should in the group write these points because you are just listening it. You are on the stage. This is how you have to design experiments. So your design should be like robust. You know, the experimental design should be robust. So actually, we have started. We are we. No, we have start. We has been starting this experiment within two months. We have just started from two months only, so we don't have that much data regarding this. So. Uh, you said that the uh, juvenile snails uh, show less response than adult in the assay, right? So maybe you haven't done that. Just speculated, okay? Huh. No, no. She was. In our syllabus, we do have this uh, uh, ganglion and uh, yes. ha, in crustaceans, they have uh, uh, ganglions, which are a bunch of nerve cells. So we can connect with this because they are not developed. They, uh, they have uh, different type of ganglions, like cerebral, pedal, pural. And uh, we can connect with that because almost all the crustaceans do have the same uh, uh, nervous system. Or Yeah, so, that, so that is why you're trying to make connections in neuroscience. Hmm. Any yeah. other But domain? we do have this on a syllabus. Like, I do have in crustaceans, in so sapia and all. Uh -huh. Sorry. But we do have the same, uh, uh, we do have the same nervous system as crustaceans and mollusks. That's fine. So, so you're connecting hmm. with, the, with those topics. Hmm. Any other thing or any other connection you want to say or we can just wind up for the lunch because lunch is waiting. Okay. So lunch is also waiting for us because they are uh, canteen. Okay. So now we will break for the uh, lunch for uh, half an hour and then we will come back again. We'll continue the session with other presentations. Okay. Thank you.